Welcome, everyone. Um, yeah, welcome, welcome to this uh, fall 2023 uh, issue of the Brookings Papers on Economic Activity. My name is John Steinson. I'm one of the co-editors of uh, the Brookings Papers, along with Jan Eberly. Um, I'll be kind of emceeing this afternoon, and Jan will take over uh, tomorrow morning. Um, the first thing I wanted to say is that we're very happy to have Ben Harris as the new Vice President and Director of Economic Studies at Brookings. Uh, we work very uh, closely with Ben on putting together the Brookings Conference. Uh, let me hand it over to Ben. He wants to say a few words to start us off. Thanks, John. I'll be very, very brief. Uh, so my name is Ben Harris. As John said, I'm the new Vice President and Director of Economic Studies at Brookings. Uh, I wanted to welcome everyone to this two-day conference uh, for BPIA, which, as you all know, is a flagship publication for the Economic Studies program. Let me just briefly uh, thank the editors, Jan Everly and John Steinson, for assembling what is truly a terrific series of papers, and also thank Helen Chen for her tireless and outstanding support of the program, Megan Waring for her leadership on event logistics, and a wide collection of Brookings staff whose contributions helped make this, con this conference a success. Last but not least, let me just thank the generous supporters uh, who make this conference and the journal possible. So the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, Brevin Howard Research Services, the General Motors Company, the National Science Foundation, State Farm Mutual Automobile Insurance Company. And we also would like to gratefully acknowledge uh, Dina Axelrod Perry for establishing the George L. Perry and William C. Brainerd BP at chair. So thank you very much, and I hope everyone enjoys the conference. So before I get it started, I just want to remind everybody that this conference is being live streamed on the internet at the moment, so this is all on the record. Um, but without further ado, let's turn it over to the first set of authors. So the first paper is accounting for the widening mortality gap between American adults with and without a BA, and Anne Case is going to be presenting. There's been a lot recently written on growing gaps in outcomes for people with and without a bachelor's degree um, across a whole lot of domains. And I want to remind you as we start here that two-thirds of American adults do not have a BA. Uh, today we'll be focusing on mortality outcomes. We think the premature death is just indicative of societal failure. And that's particularly true when it's due to what might be considered self-inflicted causes, like suicide, drug overdose, alcohol, but also possibly other behavior-related causes like smoking or obesity. Um, we th uh, let me tell you why I think, why we think that uh, mortality is a, a good metric for societal well-being. First of all, it's pretty objective. It's a zero-one event. Right? And there's not much measurement error in that part of it. Um, Money-based measures often depend on assumptions and decisions you make on what to include and how to convert those into real measures, and that's not true for mortality. It can also tell us quite a lot about how the economy is functioning for different groups within it. And we would argue that um, division by education is at least as salient as division by selected percentiles of the income distribution. So you wouldn't say like, oh, Bob, Bob just died. Mm. You know, he was only at the 38th percentile, right? That's not the kind of thing that people oftentimes would uh, lean on. Um, we also want to make the point that recent comparisons, a lot of them in the media, um, uh, between the U.S. and other wealthy countries applaud the economic success and performance recently of the U.S. But mortality comparisons make a very different, tell a very different story. So here's the life expectancy at birth uh, for 22 uh, rich countries. The one on the top is Japan, but all of Europe is basically moving in line with that. And relative to that, this is what it looks like in the U.S., Right, so back in 1980, we were more or less in the middle of the pack, but we've never done well, and we've really fallen off the bottom there. So this was actually um, 
this this uh, gave way to no fewer than three National Academy of Science panels and reports on what the hell is happening in the U.S. Um, unfortunately, none of those panels uh, did any analysis by education. And if you look at adult life expectancy, and, and you have to look at adult life expectancy because when a child is born, you don't know how many years of education they'll get. So this is the expected years of life beyond age 25. And for men and women with a four-year college degree, you can see continuous progress up until the arrival of COVID. For those without a four-year college degree, after 2010, life expectancy started to fall. And it fell for nearly a decade. Hey. Ooh, ooh, that's, that's not good. For me, anyway. Um, for, for a decade, and this was happening invisibly. This was under the radar, right? This wasn't being uh, written about in the newspapers. Politicians weren't talking about this. And then you can see when COVID hit, people without a degree uh, took a much higher hit. Now, if you put those people, and this is just a little provocative, but if you put the, those people, um, hold on, uh, something happened here. There we go. On that graph with the other 22 countries, what you see is that people with a bachelor's degree would do very well relative to Europe and the rich countries of Asia and the English-speaking world in general. Um, what's dragging the U.S. down is what's happening uh, to two-thirds of the population that don't have a BA. So when people say, uh, I don't know why this is, um, get out of there. When people say, people like people around this room, what do you mean? Things are going well, right? We're thriving. Well, one third of the country is thriving, and two thirds of the country is invisibly finding that year on year life expectancy is falling. Um, moving in different directions, where for the non BA it's going down, and for people with a BA it's going up. Uh, that is incredibly uncommon. The only other time in recent times that that's happened was in Eastern Europe after the fall of the Soviet Union. Right, so that's the company that we're keeping here, is um, divides by education that look like that. Now, back in the early 90s, which, which is where we start, because that's when education appears on death records in the U.S., uh, the gap was about uh, two and a half years. That climbs to five and a, six and a half years just before COVID and eight and a half years following uh, at the end of 2021. And it's the gap here that we're going to be looking at. And the first part of the paper is literally an accounting exercise. What are these people differentially dying of? So uh, table one in our paper has uh, a list of the most common uh, causes of death and the three that contribute the most to the gap that you've seen, the growth in the gap that you've seen, are deaths of despair, cancer, cardiovascular disease. So what we do is just in 1992, if you have a bachelor's degree, the mortality rate per 100,000 is 26. That goes up to 29, so that's an increase of three. For the people without a BA, it was 43, almost twice what it was for the BAs. 43 in 1992 goes up to 95. So without a BA, the increase in mortality was 52 per 100,000. The difference between those two being the increase in the gap of 49. So you can do this with every uh, cause of death. And during COVID, you can see that the deaths of despair among the non-BAs rose really markedly, so the difference, the gap, climbs even further. Um, during COVID, a lot of this is drug-related. A lot of this is the arrival of fentanyl on the West Coast. But it's also alcohol. That it, Alcohol had been on this upward trend, unfortunately. And then when COVID hit, the trend line changes. And suddenly, there's just a lot more death from alcoholic liver disease. Cancer, interestingly, goes the other way in the sense that 
among BAs, the death rate fell by 127 per 100,000. It fell for the non-BAs too, but not nearly as much, right? So here's a case where mortality is falling overall, but the gap widens. Um, same was true during COVID. For cardiovascular disease, which is the other big um, contributor to this gap, you can see that until 2019, it's falling for both groups. During COVID, what you see is that cardiovascular disease is rising, more so for the people without a BA. You can do this, you can do this as long as you want, it's, it's, uh, but these, these are the big uh, contributors. And I just want to point out a couple of things about a couple of them. Cardiovascular disease, we made great progress for men and for women. The two top lines are for CVD less than a BA and CVD with a BA. It was falling for both. Uh, and then around 2010, progress stops. Mystery, we can talk about it later. But it stops, and in fact, it starts to go in the wrong direction for those without a BA. So this is one where, uh, where mortality had been falling, then it stalls. For deaths of despair, it was rising for both, but a, m markedly more for people without a BA. Cancer's interesting, especially if you look at women, whose cancer rates were almost identical between those with and without a BA back in the early 90s. And then women with a BA made a lot more progress than women without. So these are going to um, um, give us uh, different ways to dig in and try to find out what is it about a BA that's making this happen. Just a couple, we don't have much time, but I want to point out a couple of things pulling cancer apart. Ovarian cancer and breast cancer for women were always the exception that proved the rule that people with a BA always do better. Because back in the early 90s, women with a BA were more likely to die of ovarian and breast cancer. Why? They had fewer children, so they had more menstrual cycles, putting them at risk for these two causes of death. But you can see that's changed. So that's some combination of, of testing and treatment, screening and treatment. And you can see that actually for breast cancer, which is the big killer, it, it's flipped entirely. Um, lung cancer, women uh, started smoking later than men. They stopped smoking later than men. And uh, you can see that once they stop smoking, uh, lung cancer deaths uh, come down for them as well. But this is something about the fact that education is going to enter into this story in different ways. If it's about screening, if it's about treatment, if it's about despair, these may be different. The big point here, though, is whether mortality is falling for both groups like cancer or rising for both groups like deaths of despair or Alzheimer's or falling and then rising, the gap keeps getting bigger. Um, and within this group of people, age 25 to 84, if you break them into smaller age groups, the percentage change in the gap is largest for the youngest. And this, this is something that resonates. We're hearing a lot about this. We're hearing a lot about the mental health of young people, people in their 20s. And um, this is uh, more evidence in, in that. Um, uh, we, the paper is not about explaining why. That's sort of like the next big round of research will be, why is this happening uh, with, to people without a BA? But well, one thing that will come up is that the number of the fraction of people going to college has changed. So selection might be an issue. And um, as we say in the paper, it may certainly be one of the causes of what we've found. We talk about that in the paper. Research to date has not found that to be a very large effect, that the bigger effects are elsewhere. But I just wanted to flag that. Um, I, uh, we think that these deaths are embedded in what's happening in life, what's happening to gaps in the college wage premium, to physical uh, health, to pain, to mental health, collapse of institutions, marriage, plummeting for people without a BA. Um, people stop being associated with organized religion, which in the US was an extremely important uh, set of institutions going back to the founding of, of the U.S. 
Um, there are also household income uh, gaps that are growing and wealth gaps that are growing. Um, this will not come as any surprise to you. This is just the median wages of people with a BA or more relative to wages of people with less than a BA. This is men and women combined, 25 to 64. When I went to graduate school, which was a long time ago, what we learned was that the college wage premium was 40%, and it was uh, roughly when I went to, college, to graduate school. Um, and that it skyrocketed. It's now 80%. Um, uh, just to be provocative, if you put the wage premium up against uh, the ratio of deaths of despair for these people, 25 to 64, they trend together. Well, a lot of things trend together. That doesn't make it true, but it makes it worth um, investigating, as are what's happened to marriage rates, extreme mental distress, pain, the difficulty socializing with friends. So losing connection, which we think is really an important part of the story as to why people fall into despair. Um, to real family total income uh, per adult equivalent. Um, in steps, there have been gains for people uh, who have a family member with a BA relative to people living in a family with no BA, which has been relatively flat. Wages or wealth. The gap in wealth has also been growing. Um, and we think that in here somewhere, within what's happening in the labor market, what's happening with social connection, uh, what's happening with treatment, with screening, um, there are going to be seeds that are worth um, sowing here to figure out what happens next. Policy options, I have time. 37 seconds, all right, perfect. <laughs> That's about what they're worth, no. Um, we need to encourage employers to hire based on skill and not on degrees. The state of Pennsylvania, Governor Shapiro, has taken that on. 92% of state jobs now in the state of Pennsylvania, you can't say that a BA is necessary. You should hire on skill. Other governors have followed suit. Um, IBM has followed suit. Uh, there's a, a foundation, paperceiling.org, that's pushing very hard to try to rewrite this from being something where we hire based just on a BA relative to skill sets. Um, I know John is going to be talking about states, and we think state legislation that is really um, uh, not kind to people, uh, to the working class people, it's in those states where we see these rates rising. Within those states, people with a BA are skating through, but people without a BA, the interaction between that and the state policies is, is um, uh, something that would, needs a ballot box to change. And of course, we can't end without saying something about healthcare costs. We think that's one of the things that driving a wrecking ball into the uh, labor market for less skilled workers. And so I'll end there. Thank you, Anne. Our first discussant is Carolyn Hawksby. Okay, so um, this is a great paper. Uh, I knew that Anne and Angus were going to produce a great paper, so it was not a surprise at all. And I also knew that the presentation would be great. So um, I'm going to just uh, steam ahead, but thank you very much for a great paper. All right, so um, it has many strengths. Uh, obviously, this topic is of great interest, not just to a sort of BPL audience, but to the general public. I'm sure that this paper is going to get a lot of coverage in the media, and it deserves to get a lot of coverage. The paper, um, I don't know whether all of you have had a chance to read it, but do read it. It's extremely thorough and extremely detailed. And 
Everything that they do in terms of their methods are very clearly explained. It's just nice in that way, too. It's nice reading a paper that's like that. All of the figures are transparent. I think you could see that for yourself, although Anne only showed a small fraction of the total figures that are in the paper. I have no idea how you were going to get through that in 16 minutes. And in many cases, the authors do anticipate the concerns that readers might have, and they're already discussed in the paper. And Anne didn't have a chance to discuss all of them, but that doesn't mean that they're not discussed in the paper. And I'm sure in the question and answer period at the end, um, uh, Angus and and Anne will be able to discuss some of those. Okay, some more strengths. I had no idea, actually, that death certificate data had education on it, but I'm now so pleased to know it's not reported for all people in all years. Some states don't have it. It starts later for some states than it does for others. The death certificates are different for different states, so the categories aren't always exactly the same, but still, it's a huge resource um, relative to uh, survey data. In particular, when it's available, it's much more comprehensive. A survey is just a survey. It can be, you know, we think of the NLSY. It's 12,686 people. <laughs> okay, that's not very big. And so there are a lot of things that you can't do about mortality or, for that matter, even about morbidity if you don't have something like the death certificate data. It's just so much more comprehensive. Um, as Anne sort of emphasized, death is a strictly bad outcome. There is no ambiguity about it. It's not like... You know, adjusting for inflation and, and wages is, is something that is hard to do, but death, no, it's bad. Okay, and, then, and um, there's just a lot of knowledge to be gained from looking at the cause of death and the age of death in the paper. And I was really impressed by that, that that's kind of where I got a lot of the meat out of the paper. Okay, there are more strengths. Um, there are many, many results in the paper that are just interesting and probably not well known. So for instance, even though the rate of death of young people is very low, the increase, the percentage increase in that rate of death has been extremely high. That's one of the most interesting results. Um, I think we all sort of anticipated, given the authors, that there would be something about deaths of despair in this paper. But what I didn't get until I read the paper was the fact that the widening mortality gap is changing for a whole, all three of these reasons. It's falling for both groups, so that's like the breast cancer example. So it's falling for both groups, but it's just falling faster for the BAs. Cardiovascular disease is similar. It's rising for both groups. That's like deaths of despair, respiratory diseases, and Alzheimer's. And then it's falling for the better educated, or the BAs, and it's rising for the, um, for the non-BAs. So all of those things are true in the paper, right? and I think that, that it's... You just learn a bunch of interesting stuff. All right, so... As you know, I'm not up here just to talk about strengths in the paper, so that's why we have discussions. So I'm going to tell you what my main concern is. It's whether it's causality or selection, right? So the selection argument would be that essentially because of people being more likely to get BAs, that the group of non-BAs is more negatively selected than it was in the past, and that's a selection argument. That's not a causality argument. Right? So everyone gets that, I hope. So this really, really matters, whether it's causality or selection or how to divide it up between the two. It could be that it's 50-50, 70-30, 80-20, but the implications are very different because if it's causality, then what we need to do is think about policy recommendations like the ones Anne was emphasizing at the end of her presentation. But if it's really selection, and that's what's doing it, then we maybe shouldn't be worried about it. We don't want to discourage people to get a BA just because it means that the non-BAs are more negatively selected. That's, you wouldn't want to think to that. Okay, so <clears throat> uh, I think that this is a serious contender, and I would not put it down as like a 10% contender or something like that. Why? Um, I, I find it entirely plausible that suction could account for most, or even in theory, all of the widening mortality gap, although, frankly, I just doubt that based on common sense. But the reason is that measures of achievement have not risen among 12th graders and other high school students for essentially the entire period since we started to measure them in a pretty consistent way using things like the National Assessment of Ad Educational Progress's long-term trend measure and other measures that I'm not going to go into because it, it get very complicated. However, the share of people who attain a BA degree has increased quite dramatically over the same period. So at some level, we have to be 
digging deeper into the population of achievement, cognitive skill, et cetera, than we were before. And also, I would emphasize that although we're going to look at achievement measures in a moment, I actually think that motivation is a very important thing, too, and just kind of having your act together, because a lot of doing well and getting a BA doesn't just have to do with I'm a high achiever. It also just has to do with I go to class, I am compliant, I do my homework, I'm well-motivated, I'm well-disciplined, and that, those are also health-related things, right? If you are a well-disciplined person, maybe you're less likely to fall into some of the causes of deaths of despair, things like that. Okay, so this is just to give you all a sense that I'm not lying to you. Um, these are reading and math scores of 17-year-olds in the United States starting in about 1970, the two uh, tests start for different years, and then going up to the most recent tests for 17-year-olds, seven, uh, which was actually only 2012, which for, that's for weird uh, U.S. Department of Education reasons. And a standard deviation on this test is about 50 points. So that would be like, if we were going to be improving quite a lot, you would have to see these lines really moving, and they're not moving over time. So achievement of the of high school graduates is basically staying the same. But the percentage um, who get a BA six years after high school graduation has been going up very steadily over the same period of time. And it's about doubled over that period of time. So that's a lot of additional selection. And it means that the people who are the non-BAs are a different group of people than they were before um, the percent with the BA going up so fast. Now, I wanted to show you a fancy graph for this today, but I got in last night at 3 a.m., and I just couldn't get it from my computer at home. I couldn't get it to come from my server, so I'll just tell you the results of it. If you look at the NLSY, the NLSY 79, so those are the people who are like 14 to 21 mostly in 1979, and the NLSY 1997, about the same age range, but um, in 1997, it shows that the distribution of ASVAB percentiles, which they all take, if you're looking at one of the National Longitudinal Surveys of Youth, sorry, I should have spelled that out, of non-BAs is shifted to the left for 1997 versus 1979. So it's just like you can see the distribution is moving to the left. And that's a measure of cognition. Um, it's widely considered to be a pretty good measure of cognition. It's very highly correlated with other measures of achievement and cognition. So although in theory it is possible that we could take more people who were going to be non-BAs and add them to the BA group and make both groups worse off in terms of mortality, that is certainly a possibility. You can write down an exercise like that. And it could also be just neutral because you could be taking some of the sicker people from the non-BA pool and then adding them to the more healthy people in the BA pool. So although that is possible, it does not appear to be the case that that's true. Okay. All right, so the main test for selection in the paper is examining changes in education mortality gaps within each birth cohort. This is a little bit of a subtle test and Anne didn't describe it in her presentation. But the way the test works is that it rests on the assumption that once you complete your education, then your education level is going to be fixed. That's kind of the undergirding assumption um, for making this test work. And the authors mainly fo focus on the age of 25 as the age of completion, but actually that is not the way Americans complete college education. Um, so the authors discuss some hypotheses, including that maybe some people are just exaggerating their education or reporting incorrectly or all kinds of things like that. But I think they're missing the most important explanation, that most of the growth in the BA attainment in the United States has been at non-selective, often for-profit schools, often online, school, online schools like the University of Phoenix or Walden. And the average age of students at these schools is 35 so they're not finishing by 25. And in fact, most of them are people who did some college education probably before the age of 25, dropped out of school, maybe went back to school a few more times. In fact, University of Phoenix and Walden, places like that, they really almost specialize in that type of person. They look at all the credits that you can transfer in, they kind of count them, and that's how you end up completing. Now, it's not that these schools have high completion rates for BAs. They do not, okay? They have very low completion rates for BAs. But if you're the sort of person who makes it through and gets a BA, 
then you are at, at, a, mo at, a, at a minimum a highly motivated, self-disciplined person. It's actually not that easy to go to college online or go to college with as few supports as you would get at one of these colleges or universities. So I'm guessing that they are quite different than, um, you know, than the people who go to places like Princeton. I'm not guessing, I know that. Okay, let me make a couple more comments. Um, the COVID years of 2020 and 2021, I just didn't find this evidence very, I don't want to say I didn't find it very interesting. It's interesting, but I didn't find it very informative in terms of the long-term economic reasoning behind the causes or the selection. And the reason is that the people without BAs were just much more likely to still have to go to work in person during COVID-19 than were the people who had advanced degrees or BAs, okay? And therefore, they were continuing to make physical contact. They were more likely to get COVID for that reason. Apart from wanting to change, have different behavior, they may have just been forced to have different behavior. So for my taste, I just find these two years too anomalous to learn very much from them. So for instance, if we look at the percent who were teleworking during COVID by educational attainment, you can see that hardly anyone with less than a high school diploma was teleworking, whereas with people with bachelor's degrees, 41% of them, essentially, and advanced degrees, 55%. So it just goes straight up. As you get to have a higher and higher degree, you were more likely to be teleworking. And percent teleworking is basically explained by the suitability of the job. Okay, this is a a BLS study, so I won't go into exactly how they determine what is a suitable job for teleworking, but again, you can see that only people with bachelor's and advanced degrees. I have some minor concerns, so let me, can I have 30 seconds for them? Okay, great. Um, using more geographic richness of the data, because the data is geographically very rich, might help with causal identification, and that's because states differ in their post-secondary systems, especially in their public post-secondary systems. So some are going to have a lot more people who will have been brought into college than others, and some states are going to have, it's going to be easier to get a BA, it's going to be cheaper to get a BA, so I think you can do something with that. Um, I would, maybe during the discussion Q&A, we can learn more about who reports educational attainment for death certificates, because there's not just measurement error, but also we might worry about bias. If it's your children reporting versus a spouse, versus a nurse, versus someone who doesn't know you very well, like maybe a friend or something like that. Um, I don't really love the BA, non-BA binary thing. I would be more enthusiastic about measures of cognition, achievement, or attainment that are more continuous. And the typical the typical death certificate does contain several categories of attainment. And then finally, I think it's very useful to distinguish, at least I found it very useful to distinguish, the more I read the paper, between changes over time that are likely due to behaviors that people themselves can control, like smoking or taking drugs, and changes that are likely due to advances in medicine beyond anyone's control, like better treatment of breast cancer or something like that. But all in all, I wanted to thank uh, the authors for an important and comprehensive paper, and I think everyone should hear, hear should give it a really thoughtful reading. Our second discussant is Jonathan Skinner. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, this, is a, this was a wonderful paper. Um, I want to begin uh, with acknowledging uh, Victor Fuchs, who died a few weeks ago. Um, an amazing person, and it's rare that you can identify somebody as starting an entire field in economics. I guess David Ricardo, maybe. Uh, perhaps rarer that he would have still been with us until quite recently. Um, and I think he had a front row seat on the economics profession. He talked about being a graduate student with uh, Art Oaken, which takes us back a few years. Um, but he, right up to the end, he had a very, very keen sense for exactly what are the interesting questions and what's important. And that, I think, was his defining characteristic. Um, this was the last uh, email I received from him in, in August. Um, my main interest these days is low life expectancy in the U.S. relative to other high-income democracies. 
Um, <clears throat> I, as those of you who know him uh, understand, you would never want to presume to think of what Vic would say, but I think um, he would approve uh, of this graph because to me this exactly shows what he was uh, pointing out that college educated people are sort of keeping up with other high, uh, high income countries and those without a college degree are falling seriously behind. Um, so I'm, I'm, I, I would say, I sort of think of this as two different papers. One is through 2019 and the other is, is for COVID. Um, I think of, the, of COVID as a stress test, uh, which we failed uh, pretty, poor, pretty badly. Um, lots of other countries you know, had similar problems, and uh, we seem to have done much worse. And, and I think that you know, as, the, as the data come in, this will become um, the, 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 uh, that, drop, that sharp drop will become attenuated. The question is, where will we end up on the other side, assuming, uh, let's hope, that the COVID um, uh, pandemic uh, kind of continues to wind down. Um, what I found particularly interesting, though, was that the deaths of despair just continued to, to rise. In the two years uh, of 2019 to 2021, the deaths per, per um, 100,000 from alcohol deaths exceeded all of the previous increase from 1992 to 2019. So it's clearly there's like something going on, and we can only hope that those trends... Uh, at least stop their dramatic uh, rise. Um, so a quick sort of methodology. There, there are two ways to measure mortality. One is uh, mortality rates. And in some ways, the more important measure is life expectancy, or as they use life expectancy between age 25 and 84. Um, I think by extending the the life expectancy out to 84, you're certainly picking up the effects of COVID. So that's sort of hitting. Um, and you're also weighting more heavily uh, the lost life years at ages 25, 35 from deaths of despair, as you should. But those, are, I think, are being affected by, by quite different things. Fortunately, they do break things out. So there's always sort of calculations and tables by age. But I think for policy purposes, the way that you address the rising mortality would differ whether it's a 35-year-old who's lost his job or her job versus a 75-year-old uh, who perhaps is, is having trouble getting in to see their primary care doctor. So the key question, as Anne mentioned, is like, what's going on here? Like, how can we explain it? And, um, and uh, I guess there's a, a, a portmanteau of uh, different effects. Uh, uh, there's morbidity, marriage rates, out of wedlock children, a lot of different things going on. Um, and so to try to kind of get, get a foothold here, as you might expect, I, I, I tend to think about regional differences in, in what's going on. And so I use data that's actually uh, online. You can download it. It's from a paper that I wrote with um, Chris Foote and Ellen Mira and, and, and Chris's team at the Boston Fed that, that looks at state-level mortality rates, midlife, that is, ages 25 through 64. And, um, and I, I, again, I rank them by, by the change over time. So 1992 is the reference year. And uh, here are five states that rank at the top. You can see dramatic increase for non-college graduates. Um, oddly, West Virginia, Kentucky, Indiana, Tennessee, and Ohio, they all seem to be Republican uh, states in the sense that they voted for Trump in uh, a majority in uh, 2020. Um, these are the, 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 the five best performing um, states. And the interesting thing here is that New York actually does pretty well. This is something that was also in a Raj Chetty study as well, that, that even low-income people living in New York City seem to have longer life expectancies. And so it's, it's not sort of this uniform effect, but instead it seems to be this interaction between place and be, not having a BA degree. 
that leads to this very, very wide variation. Now, obviously, I've designed it this way. All the other states are kind of somewhere in between. But it does show the extent to which where you happen to live really matters for how you did in terms of midlife mortality. Well, <laughs> college graduates, it seems like you're, if, 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 you're in, if you're in that club, it doesn't matter as much where you lived. Like, everybody seems to benefit. In long terms, there's still a lot of variation. It's just that the rates are, are, are so much lower. Um, and, but, but still, Tennessee did better than, in terms of improvements than, than some of the states and some of the Democratic states in this group. But it does, again, this is why I'm emphasizing that it, you know, even though college graduates, it matters where you live, it just seems like the magnitude in terms of the numbers uh, are greater for the non-college graduates. So we're economists. The first thing we think of is like this is income. And I've had trouble finding studies that show very large effects. There's business cycles. Um, don't, don't seem to uh, have much of an effect. Um, Amy Finkelstein just gave a talk yesterday about um, even 10, year, 10 years after the Great Recession, that places that got hit really badly, um, their mortality rates were actually lower. Like they did better, probably because of less pollution. So when we looked at the data, we, look, you know, we thought about well, changes in poverty rates, changes in manufacturing, things like that would explain these differences. But they don't. Uh, there are specific cases where, like China shocks, where you might find more evidence. But in general, we were surprised, and this is also consistent with Ann and Angus's work, at, at how little income seems to be kicking in here in terms of explaining these very, very different patterns. Um, the one way that income does matter is as follows. This is 1968 mortality versus 1968 income. You'll notice that New York has higher mortality rates than Arkansas. Um, now, you may say, why? Well. Um, that's probably why. This is uh, from Mad Men, as you may recall. Um, people smoked a lot in New York back in 1968. They drank a lot. They, you know, they did all the things you watched on TV. Um, but, but the strange thing is that if you use 1968 income and rank 2019 mortality, it's, it's like when you turn on one of these magnet things and all the, the, the steel filings like line up. And that's what seems to have happened. So it's not the change over time. The income, the income rankings pretty much don't change very much. But it's the mortality changes are strongly affected by what income was in 1968. And that, to me, is like a big puzzle. Um, some sociologists, in, in particular Jessica Montes and her colleagues, have suggested that this is about state-level policies. So, if you think about the tobacco tax, minimum wages, the earned income tax credit, pollution controls, Medicaid expansion, all of these things, they were implemented by high-income states in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. This was, as some of you may recall, when block grants became the fashion in the Reagan administration. These uh, uh, take effect, uh, with apologies to the macroeconomists, with a long and variable lag. So it's really hard to measure, like, this thing was passed here. Well, it turns out that it takes 20 or 30 years for cigarette smoking to start killing you. So it's hard to kind of figure out when that should actually kick in. Yet I still see a role for economic opportunity. I'm, I'm convinced by everything I read about these decaying towns and, and you know, the China shock, the closing of plants leading to greater deaths of despair. Um, Zach Cooper has a paper with uh, colleagues showing higher health care costs arising from hospital mergers seems to lead to unemployment, uh, greater overdose deaths. So all of these things suggest that uh, economic factors matter. Uh, in ongoing research with uh, Chris Foote and Ellen Mira, we're finding that even in these progressive states that the low-income counties uh, continue to lag behind. So I, I think that there's still this sort of mystery that that we're trying to figure out, but I think is critical. So just to quickly sum up, um, Case and Deaton have, have demonstrated a remarkable increase in the education mortality gradient. And this is 
this is really shocking, and it should be, I, to my mind, the primary public health concern in the U.S., like what's going on. And th this is a great research topic because the two key questions of like why and what are the best policies to address the, the problem, I think are still uh, uh, under debate. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Let's open it up for general discussion. Uh, Jim Stock. Yeah, just a very uh, quick, uh, specific question. Um, I didn't hear any discussion about obesity. Now, uh, obesity trends have been uh, getting worse over the last, let's say, 15 years. And I, and I do know that the level of obesity is higher among lower educated individuals. I don't know what the differential trends are. Uh, it's also it's really striking to me. I'm staring at a CDC uh, obesity map, and it was really striking to me that of Jonathan's worst five states, they all have the highest tier obesities of over 40% of the adult population, and of the best five states, uh, three of those five at least have the are in the opposite side, which is the lowest obesity rates. So I guess just some question on that. Now, that might not be death or despair, but it certainly might be related to cardiovascular disease, which is a major, a, a big driver here. Robert Gordon. You go ahead. You're on. Oh, on. okay. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to follow up on the comment on, on obesity um, because I think we need, for policy purposes, uh, to get a different kind of division of causes beyond heart disease versus breast cancer versus other kinds of cancer and so on. Um, and I was going to suggest going beyond the um, deaths of despair, which I like to think of as SAD, suicide, alcohol, and drugs, SAD, um, and uh, divide up the other causes uh, between the non-SAD aspects of personal responsibility. Uh, in addition to obesity uh, relating to heart disease, of course, it's also a precursor of diabetes. Um, but going beyond that, uh, think of the distinction in people who have lower levels of education uh, between access to insurance, including Medicaid, and the very different uh, but sometimes correlated uh, dimension of physical access to healthcare facilities. Uh, just as we have food deserts uh, in some large city low-income areas, uh, we have health deserts. Uh, it's simply more miles between hospitals on the south and west sides of Chicago uh, than it is on the north uh, and on the north side. Um, and of course, this extends in particular to rural areas, uh, which I'm sure are registering uh, some of these high death rates. So uh, I would like to see a distinction uh, between areas of personal responsibility outside of SAD um, and the distinction between access to the payment for health care versus the physical distance aspect of health care. Martin Bailey. Um. First, a cynical, perhaps a trivial comment, but I uh, was surprised that none of the, the policy recommendations didn't include encouraging more people to go to college. In fact, uh, if I were a coalition of uh, college presidents uh, that was having trouble recruiting students, I would have thought that uh, uh, a new uh, recruitment tool would be uh, come to college and uh, uh, die, uh, die later. But that's, uh, <laughs> that's my uh, trivial comment. Um, I'm, I was sort of shocked. This is a, sh a shocking paper in a way, and, and uh, to see all these results, um, and, but maybe to follow up a little on Bob Gordon's comment, I would have expected that given the increased access to health care that we've had with Medicare expansion, I realize that hasn't been all states, but we've had a huge increase in the number of people with uh, health insurance. Uh, there was a huge investment in... Uh, dealing with the, the COVID, we didn't necessarily do it very well. We spent a lot of money. I mean, if you got COVID, you go to the hospital, you got treated. Um, and uh, the, the number of 
uh, if you actually look at how the hospitals performed with COVID, I think the US hospitals performed at least as well as, as the European hospitals in that respect. So it was shocking to me to see uh, this huge uh, uh, effect. And I understand, I think Carolyn Hawksby certainly right, a lot of that had to do with whether you uh, uh, had to go to uh, work or not. Um, but of course people, I think a fair number of people in Europe had to go to work too, so that, that doesn't, doesn't necessarily distinguish between the two, uh, the two groups. So I was, I was uh, really dismayed to see that, that uh, the, the healthcare thing didn't, didn't sort of moderate some of the effects that you're, you're showing. Uh, finally, um, there's definitely a tone to this paper and your earlier papers that sort of uh, the economy is failing everybody, and I, I, as a good liberal, I sort of agree with that. Um, but I do think there is, um, you know, more room to think about individual responsibility in some of this. Uh, so it's not just um, we're not we're not forcing people to drink more. We're not forcing people to take opioids. And I realize people get addicted to these things, but there are there is agency over those uh, things that people can exercise regardless of uh, the particular uh, position they're in. Stan Roger. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, so um, three, three quick points. One, um, on, um, on Martin's final, the first point on his joke, of course, if everything here is selection, the more people you give BAs, the worse the selection problem gets, and the worse the relative scores for, for people with and without BAs will get. And so you know, that may only exacerbate your, your, uh, uh, your problem here. Um, a, a more serious selection point, perhaps, is um, is across the country and the cross-sectional variation. Uh, to the extent that high-income states and especially high-income places within high-income states have made it increasingly difficult to move to those places through restrictive land use policies, you know that may explain a lot of what we what we see in the data. Right? If the um, people without BAs who live in the richest cities and the richest states are increasingly positively selected. That may explain some of the some of the patterns uh, you see in the cross-sectional uh, data. And so I'd, I'd I'd be concerned about. I don't know how big that effect can be, but it would make me worry about drawing conclusions that are too strong from the cross-sectional uh, variation. Um, and then thirdly, on the health insurance point, I agree. We've pretty dramatically expanded health insurance, especially for the for the relevant groups here over the past few decades, but of course that has two effects, right? One, conditional on getting sick, you get presumably better treatment or access to treatment. But secondly, it increases access to, uh, to opioids and lowers their prices. And so to the extent uh, that you think the problem is really driven by the opioid epidemic, it's not surprising that expansions of health insurance coverage uh, would exacerbate the, the problem. There's some papers that allege that. I don't know that they're super good, but it's certainly a theory that people have entertained. And I think it may explain some of the, the counterintuitive effects of, of the healthcare expansions we've seen. Patsy Stevenson. Um, sorry. Uh, so I, I actually had the same thought Martin Bailey had, which is, um, you know, isn't one of the recommendations potentially more education? Uh, notwithstanding Caroline's very good point about there being potential selection, I think if you look over the aggregate data, the U.S. is falling behind, so there's got to be something real going on. And this is happening at a time where we know more and more and more about what to do to have a healthy life. We have good evidence about the role of exercise, the role of a plant-based diet, of not consuming too much alcohol, that you can manage pain using Tylenol and ibuprofen following surgery very effectively if you get ahead of the pain. So there's a lot of knowledge out there. Uh, and I wonder if the, if the issue really is about people's ability to take in that knowledge and make good choices. So I, I, I cringed a little when Martin Bailey said, we're not forcing them to drink. I want to make sure we're equipping them with the skills necessary to make good choices. And I think college does that. And so I cringed a little bit when you said, oh, the answer might be, let's hire people without college degrees, because I think we teach people real skills in college. Otherwise, I would struggle to get up and go to work every day. Um, and I think that these skills are also helping them make better healthcare decisions. 
And one, one last thing I'll say about that is I see a real difference when I look at my parents' generation. Educated or not educated, they don't like getting off the couch, they don't like the plant-based diet, they still like their cocktails. But when I look at people in their 50s, I see really big differences in the actions people are taking to prolong their life. And I wonder if that's a real causal effect of the education gradient. Justin Wolfers? Uh, I just wanted to come back to Caroline's provocative claim that potentially selection could do all the work here. And knowing Caroline as I do, I'm sure she's thought of this, but also knowing Anne and Angus as I do, I'm sure they've thought of this, which is it seems like there's a very simple calibration that one could do in order to figure out whether this hypothesis has legs. So Caroline got to the first part, there is selection into a BA, I get that. But is it big enough and are the differentials big enough that it's got enough legs to actually explain these quite striking graphs? That seems like half a, two paragraphs of math and would be super informative. Hoyt Blakely. Hi, thanks. So I know it's always cheap to ask the author to see how it contradicts her earlier work, but uh, here we are, cheap shots. The, so if I think of this as the decade of despair, your earlier decades would be the gradient, maybe, and early life conditions mattering. And I'm wondering, vis-a-vis -vis the gradient, your work on the you know, earlier kind of static and cross-country analysis of the gradient, how much should we be updating the things that we teach people based on it apparently being highly unstable in some places and not in others? And the other thing is about you know, your persuasive work by you and others about early life conditions and its determinants on health. Does that give you pause when thinking about policies that you might send to adults when a lot of these things might be determined before they become adults? Elena Buckman. Hi, Elaine Buckberg. Thank you for this paper, which has such striking and concerning results. And you've got two problems that you're making evident. One is the deaths of despair difference by education, and the second is for less behaviorally related illnesses that the outcomes are diverging. The Affordable Care Act hasn't changed that result or prevented it, and this seems to raise, um, as others have said, and this seems to raise really important questions about um, disparities in timeliness, quality, and quantity of care, that insurance isn't binary, and how is how long you wait for a screening based on your health or how long you wait for an appointment um, or what are your marginal charges impacting this outcome. So that would be a great extension. So let's take three more questions and then turn it over to the authors. Alan Blinder first. Alan Blinder, in, in addition to complimenting the uh, presentations, all of them, <clears throat> I'd like to pick up on the selection thing a little bit. I think a, a lot of what Carolyn said and a lot of what other people have said sort of make the distinction between people who sort of get their lives, their acts together, and people who don't get their acts uh, together, of which getting a BA is one, but not the only aspect. It made me wonder about this. Suppose we could actually make progress on that, or, because, or maybe people in their 50s are doing better than people in their 70s, and we are making progress, whichever it is, and get more people into the get their act together category, and, put, and that line showing the share with BAs keeps going up. Are we going to be able to have jobs for... 50, 60 percent of the population, BA style jobs with 50, 60 percent of the uh, population having BAs. I don't know the answer to that. Penny Goldberg. Um, two comments. Uh, so first of the issue of selection. So even if selection drives the gap between college educated and non-college educated. One fascinating fact that you also document in your previous work is that life expectancy in the US is going down on average. And it's hard to see how the selection alone can drive this result. I mean, I guess you can construct theoretically cases where this is possible, but um, I don't quite see it. So it would be interesting to explore that. Uh, second, coming, uh, I want to come back to Jonathan's comment about place. I think there is a lot of work in economics, um, 
recently that has emphasized the importance of space for economic outcomes. And I, I would like to tie your results to what the trade literature, for example, has found. Um, and place there matters. Uh, so I, I do think that the interaction between college education and place may be key to understanding the results. And also, you know, following up on Jonathan's comments, I don't think it's just about income, or it's, it's about income in the first place. So for example, in the context of trade, people have documented that the China shock did not result in, result in lower wages or lower income in the affected areas, but lower employment, worse mental health. Um, so all the, you know, the kind of outcomes that might lead to deaths of despair, among other things. And finally, if you're concerned about selection, uh, selection in terms of residential location would be even more pronounced than when it comes to college. So again, I think the interaction of the two would be crucial for understanding the gap. Ben Harris. Thank you. Just uh, quickly, I wonder about the role of labor force attachment. You discussed wages, but, but not a whole lot of discussion around labor force attachment. Yesterday I was having a discussion with an economist who informed me that retirement kills. Uh, and for older workers, when they leave the labor force, they lose, for some of them, they lose their social interaction, they lose the intellectual stimulation, and they lose the wages. Uh, and of course, LFPR and labor force attachment varies by place and also varies by educational attainment. So just wondering, particularly for the older workers, or perhaps even for younger workers, uh, the role of, of LFPR. All right, let me turn it over to the authors. Good. Okay. Thank you both, um, Carolyn and John. <coughs> Sorry. Um, doesn't stretch much further, so I'll put myself right on top of the microphone. Um, thank you both, Carolyn and John, for those excellent and well thought out um, comments. Um, I, I wanted, I, I think I'm going to let Anne deal with most of the things, but I wanted to say a little bit about causality selection. Um, when I was coming here on the train, I was trying to think how many people here are older than I am. And I think I'm probably, I can see two or three, but um, <laughs> there's, it, it, it's been a really, really long time. Um, and, you know, when I think back into when I first came into the profession in the 60s and 70s, the word causality was never discussed. Um, and you look in the indexes of the best econometrics textbooks from that area, like Tile or all the others, it was just not there. And we were dodging something there for sure, because we were implicitly talking about it while trying to stay away from it all the time. Now, in more recent years, we've become obsessed with causality, and in my view, that's worse. Um, because I think we don't really know what we're talking about a lot of the time. And I have a very, very different view of causality than much of the profession. And to some extent, I differ from Carolyn. But let, let me try to delineate that, because there's actually quite a lot I agree with. So I think that the idea of distinguishing between causality on the one hand, there is a causal effect there, and trying to find out what it is, versus selection or other explanations is not, to me, a very useful way of going. I think of selection as a causal mechanism. It's a mechanism that causes these things to happen. Now, so then it becomes almost you know, arbitrary whether you call it causal or not. It's certainly true, I agree with Carolyn, that the policy implications would be different if it's selection. But the policy differences are different depending on which particular causal mechanism is going on here. And I don't think, I think this hunt which much of the education mortality, education health literature in economics has done, which is trying to find whether there is a causal effect of education, I think is really quite misguided. One of the most important papers in this literature, I think, is not by economists at all, but it's by Joe Phelan and Bruce Link, who invented something called the fundamental causes theory. And they, the fundamental causes theory says that power income, education, all of those good things will affect your health if and only if there's an opportunity through which health can be affected. Now, 
One of the more spectacular findings of that, and I draw this in my book, um, The Great Escape, is before about 1750 in England, and we have data back to about 1300, there was no gradient. Um, the death rates among the nobles, the aristocrats, the monks, and all the rest of it was just the same as the death rate among the general population. And that was because you could be educated up the kazoo, you could have an enormous palace, you could be fabulously rich, but there wasn't any way you could stop the cholera killing your kids or stop the smallpox infecting you. No one knew how to do it. And it was only after about 1750 in Britain that the mechanisms began to be available and those mechanisms were typically seized by the rich and powerful first, but then people caught up behind that. Now, if you look at what's happening today, there's lots of different things happening. And the cancer thing is like the story of what happened in Britain in 1750. Education wasn't gonna do you any good against brain cancer. It still doesn't do you any good against brain cancer. And it didn't used to do women much good against breast cancer. In fact, it did them harm some ways. So why is that changed? It's changed because screening is really important. And it's changed because there's been a huge innovation in anti-cancer drugs, which may bankrupt us all, but nevertheless, they're actually quite effective. Um, and so that has really given an opportunity for women to use their education to get scanned, um, for women to use their access to healthcare um, to bring down those mortality rates. And that's new. I mean, Nixon declared war on cancer in 1970. There'd be no decrease in mortality rates for 20 years before that among anyone. There'd be no decrease in mortality rates from cancer after that until 1990. So the pictures Anne showed are really the first time this has really happened. And it's because a new mechanism opened up. And that's where you have to look for the policy thing. Now, I think of COVID as part of that story too. And I agree absolutely with Carolyn. We know what happened. Um, and what she showed from the BLS, that's been well documented. We wrote it up in a paper of our own a long time ago, um, or not a long time ago, but at, in the early COVID days. And that was, you know, COVID opened up another mechanism whereby more educated people could sit on Zoom all the time and they didn't have to take the risks of, you know, working in a supermarket or whatever, which sort of did them in. And so once again, there was a different mechanism so all of these mechanisms um, are different. Each one has a different policy implication. You know, and there was no gradient, as I said, in historical periods where there was nothing, there was no way to use your education to make this happen. And so you, know, you have to look at each, each of these causal mechanisms are different, different ones operate at different times, and the policy implications for each of them are different. So, we, in the paper, spent quite a lot of time trying to explain why we don't just think selection is a big deal. And I know economists love selection. They want selection to be a big deal. You know, we used to ignore that too until Jim Hatman came along and taught it's different. But you can see in, there are several of the graphs late in the paper, which Anne did not present, where you can take people much older than 35, people 40, 45, 50, track them into their 80s, there's no change in education. They're not reporting any change in education. It's, you know, one of the things we document in the paper is people tend to get more educated as they get older, long past the plausible date when they're actually getting certificates. They're giving themselves degrees. But it, <coughs> if you look at these people who are like in their 40s and 50s, especially women, where they're not reporting any increase at all, you can see the gap expanding within that birth cohort as you track it over time. So all of the things we're looking at here are happening within cohorts where there's no education change at all. So it's implausible that that happens. Okay, I'm going to let Anne deal with the other thing. Do I have time? You have a few minutes, yeah. This one. So I also wanted to thank Caroline and John. Those were great comments. I, um, there's actually quite a lot of work that's been done now on selection and whether or not it could be large enough. And the answers that keep coming back is that it's just not large enough to uh, be responsible for the lion's share of what we're seeing here. And one of the things that I wouldn't have, I would love to like run up there and plug in my computer 
is that if you look at women uh, born between, say, 1950 and 1965, 19, yeah, mid-60s, uh, birth cohort to birth cohort, there was no change in the fraction who got a BA. But if you look at what happened to them in terms of deaths from suicide, drugs, and alcohol, each later born birth cohort is at higher and higher risk. So it would be, it's kind of hard to tell a selection story. And then, and then as women did get more education, though, the, the increase in deaths of despair, it's not as if it's changed dramatically, it's just rising with each later born birth cohort. Um, uh, uh, Arlene Geronimus has a paper on this. Uh, David Cutler also with Ellen. Uh, tried to see what would happen if we, it, by shifting people around and seeing if it made a difference. There's actually quite a lot of work on this, and, and it's not seen to be or thought to be large enough. I want to talk about a couple of things. Obesity. I mean, obesity is a, a really big problem. But the, the thing that's hard and why it's going to be harder to tell a story about it is that obesity actually has been rising for decades. And it rose for decades, and during those decades, deaths from cardiovascular disease fell and fell and fell. So, you know, you can, t and then suddenly, uh, cardiovascular disease uh, progress flatlined. It flatlined in the US, it flatlined in most English speaking countries, it flatlined in every state it, at exactly the same moment. Well, obesity patterns are different in different states. So there's something else going on that we don't understand. Um, that doesn't mean obesity is not a problem. I think in the end of the day, whenever the end of the day comes, if we're going to make progress on obesity, we're going to have to see it as, as an addiction the way we think about addiction to alcohol or drugs. People have to soothe the beast. Some people do it with alcohol. Some people do it with um, gelato, right? <coughs> so I think that that's one of the things where the health care is going to have to try to get its head around the fact that it's also a mental health issue as much as a physical health issue. Um, the, I think like, well, these people have to take responsibility for their actions. They become addicted to drugs or they become alcoholics or, or they kill themselves. Well, that was their choice. I think if you, why is it that those choices are being made only by people who don't have access to uh, proper mental, hair, mental health care, right? They don't get to go to the gym and work with a private trainer. They don't get to go to a fancy restaurant and, and um, try to let their woes be gone. So I think that like, if you thought like a sociologist, it would be the case that society is doing something to this group, grinding them down in a way that they can't get beyond. And um, that's a, a big problem. In 1945, after the Second World War, Britain decided on a national health service, in part because it wanted to change the, the fact that there were large differences in um, a mortality by occupation. So they decided that free public health care was the way to go and that was going to solve the problem. It hasn't solved the problem there. And we think that while health care and access to it is very important, we don't think that, that, that this is a problem that's going to be solved necessarily in a doctor's office. Early life matters a lot. Think about what's going to happen to the children in families that have lost a parent to drugs or alcohol or suicide we have a problem coming down the road um, from that as well. So um, I'm getting the zero sign, so I'll stop there. But I would love to lock the door and keep talking at you. <laughs> All right, let's uh, break until 2.30.
seated and, and get this show on the road again. Okay, I think we're ready to start. Our second paper is titled Hidden Exposure, Measuring U.S. Supply Chain R Reliance, um, and Richard Baldwin is going to be presenting. Thank you very much. Wow, that's loud. Um, first of all, I want to thank uh, Jan and Jan for inviting us to give this paper. It's really great to share our work with such an august audience. On a personal uh, tone, I'm very happy to be back here. I gave a Brookings paper here in 1987 on the persistence of the U.S. trade uh, deficit uh, based on hysteresis thinking. And I think actually two people in the audience were at that. I think uh, Bob Hall and Martin Bailey were actually there when we, when we gave that paper. So uh, same room, actually. The, the text a little better, though. Now... This paper is joint with uh, Rebecca Friedman from the Bank of England and, and Angelos Theodor Kopopoulos from Ashton Business School in Birmingham. And uh, I will make the presentation. They will answer all your hard and difficult questions, as one does when you're the senior author. So <clears throat> let's just jump right into it. First of all, apologies and outline. There's many things in the paper uh, that we don't have time to present, so my general, uh, you know, apology for the sins of omission, especially if we don't mention your super important paper. Sorry about that. <laughs> Most of them are in the paper, and if they're not, let us know. We'll put them in the paper. The second thing is, uh, although the economics profession has, in fact, been studying global value chains for a couple decades, including me personally, we have not been focusing on risk or disruption. So there's very elegant, very compelling frameworks for thinking about how you construct and participate and change your participation in global value chains, but there is very little to think about supply chain disruptions. So when we think about this, one of the things we do in the paper is we say, well, global supply chain disruptions, that naturally falls into three categories of analysis. The links that make up the global supply chains, the shocks that disrupt the global supply chains, and the policies that mitigate the global supply chain disruption. And that's the way the presentation will go and the way the talk will go. Most of our substantive contribution is on the measurement of the links, and so that's what we're going to spend most of the time on. Okay, <clears throat> links, conceptual background. There is a lot of work on supply chains. There is, in fact, an entire profession, logistics, risk change management, who study these things and measure these things. They have scientific associations and journals. Most of them use what we call the business view, which is the word, where the word chain comes from. And this is ultimately popularized by Michael Porter, who talked about value chains. So from a single firm perspective, they buy, make, and sell. And when you want to think about the supply chains, the buyers at your tier one suppliers. And then you want to think about your tier two suppliers and tier three suppliers. But each of this is from the perspective of a single firm. But you can understand why they call it a chain, because it actually looks like a chain of firms. Now, that would be like looking at your ancestry and considering, you know, let's suppose I did uh, a family tree, which I did during COVID because I was so bored. Um, and I was at the bottom of it, sorry to say. And, and my parents were the tier one suppliers and the grandparents were their tier two suppliers, et cetera. And so I, I, I traced it all the way back to England in the 1500s, but it was all a chain of people going up. But from a population perspective, there's relationships between these relationships which are not found when you only look up uh, a family tree. Same thing's true in economics. So the economic approach to supply chains realizes that there's a recursiveness in the buy, make, sell, and firms are selling to firms who are selling to firms, so it's not a supply chain. A supply chain is a supply matrix. It's a network. And so that's the, on the right side there, the little box, the firms selling to each other, 
creates a matrix or a table of selling one to another, often grouped into, uh, aggregated into sectors and by countries. And we distinguish between raw materials, which really aren't made by anybody, and primary factors that they use. And we make a very clear distinction between intermediate goods, which are sold B2B, and final goods, which gets absorbed into something. And so that's the economic perspective, and we're going today be using the economic perspective to measure global supply chains. I'll continue saying chains, even though I mean matrix or table. Okay, what tools do we need to measure links? Now, something has changed because the answer to this question has changed hugely in the last few years. The 1990s vibe, the global value chains, the GVCs, these links are productive, and they wanted to measure where the work was actually done. That led to a focus on value-added trade and measures like backward linkages, where value-added trade explicitly stripped out the intermediates. So, for example, let's suppose you wanted more good jobs in Detroit in the auto industry, and you were looking at trade flows. You'd see stuff coming from Canada, but you would ignore the stuff that the U.S. had exported to Canada that got put into the intermediates and then re-imported. And you did that with what was called value-added trade, and it was eliminating double counting. So that was a good thing. The 2020 vibe, the global supply chains, the links are vulnerable. So we want to measure who is sending what to whom. And therefore, there's a focus on gross trade, or what we used to just call trade. So <laughs> the answer uh, for the example is this Ambassador Bridge, when the uh, truckers blocked the bridge between Windsor and Detroit, and stop the flow, they didn't just stop the Canadian value added, they stopped the gross flow. So if you want to know about disruptions, you can't just focus on the value added. In 2021, 2022, we developed some new measures uh, based on gross value chain, and we're just totally chuffed that the OEC has decided to adopt them and will put them into their new database that will be up in November. Um, Two types of gross trade measures are super important. The first one is face value, which is the intermediate purchases from the tier one suppliers. That you can read from the data, or at least input-output data. The look-through basis is when you take all the intermediates purchased directly and indirectly via suppliers' purchases from other suppliers. So you look through the veil of the who's selling what, and you realize where were the intermediates actually made in gross terms. Now, that will lead to massive double counting, which you do have to take account of, but it gives you a perspective, for example, of how much is actually coming from China. Not just how much do we direct, import directly, but every, everything. So um, the um, links, basic facts on face value basis. So the reason we're going to go through this, because in this area, a lot of people are basing all their thinking on a few analogies. And we just want to show that in the U.S. sectors, there's a huge amount of heterogeneity. So this shows that you can tell on these slides that the big words there, that's the key point to the slides, and the, and the chart is hopefully supports it, or you could just take my word for it. So supply chain exposure varies widely by U.S. sector and by type of input. So there's 17 sectors in our database. If you look at the far left one, that's refined petroleum, and you can see it's very reliant on supply chains because almost 75% of its gross production is made up of intermediate inputs. And you can also see from the gray that most of that's primary. You won't be shocked. Go to the right scale, you see the motor industry, and you see it is also very dependent on intermediate inputs, 75% of the gross output, but most of it's manufactured goods. And so that is, which, which, which it matters depends a lot. Now what we're going to do in this slide is show that foreign exposure is most important for manufactured goods, not those other types. So the orange is breaking down the orange bars into foreign source versus domestic source. And since those add to 100, we only graph the foreign. And we've ranked them so increasing foreign shares of inputs. And you see those top five uh, categories, vehicles, machinery, mechanical, electrical equipment, pharmaceuticals, and electronics. They have over 30% of their intermediates coming from foreign sources. So this is where you, you might worry about uh, exposure. But there's a bunch of them that, where they're much lower. Now, if we look at the basic facts on a look-through basis, you see somewhat different uh, view. What we're going to do here is look at the share of look-through manufacturing inputs by sector and by country in 2018, which is the latest year in our database. And this is where the title of the paper comes from, Hidden Exposure. 
So the U.S. is the main supplier to the U.S. of intermediate goods, 88% averaged over all their manufacturing, only 12% from foreign. China is the top foreign supplier, but not the dominant one. They're supplying uh, 3.5% of, of the total, uh, uh, of that 12%. Uh, but they are bigger than the next two or three ones added up together. So it's, it's uh, the, the number one by a long shot. And if you drill down, I don't have that much time, but if you drill down into the sectors, you'll see that those numbers change differently, but China's number one role doesn't change very frequently. And there's still often China's supply is, is as big as the next two or three together. In particular, it's usually bigger than Mexico and Ch Canada added up together. So when, when you look at uh, face value statistics, you don't see how important China is into the supply chain. So here's the hidden links. Take one, look through versus face value exposure. And we're going to do this by checking out who is the top foreign supplier in each of these sectors. So here, what we're going to do is the top foreign supplier percentage of the manufacturing sector. So on the left side, five minutes, okay. But that's for the first set of slides, right? <laughs> so um, the face value, China, or a little bit over 60% of the sectors, China is the number one supplier. On a look-through basis, it's all but one is that. And you can see Canada and Mexico prominent in face value, but they're importing a lot from China in intermediates, putting them in intermediates, and then supplying them to the U.S. The, uh, if you, the, you know, most of you are very experienced scholars. You know, you spend months on a paper, 45 pages long, and people only remember one number. That's on this slide. Look through, U.S. look-through exposure to China is 3.8% higher than its face value exposure. I think that's the one. You know, if you guys want to take a screenshot and tweet it out, I'd be okay with that. Um, you guys are not a very funny audience here. <laughs> it's 3.8 times. Yes, 3.8 times. That's correct. Yes. And you can see them coming down. The East Asian producers of, of intermediate goods are all very high. Looking at the bottom, you can actually see the U.S. ratio is 1.1 because the U.S. makes stuff that gets put into intermediates that then they re-import. So it's not one, as you might expect. Hidden exposure two, there was a rapid geoconcentration of this sourcing, again involving China. So if we look at China's exposure rose rapidly. If you look at 2018, the, the left charts are exactly the same before. The right pair of charts is what it was in 1995. And you see China was nowhere in 1995 on face value or look through. It was Canada and uh, was a big one. And the hidden value was with Japan, because you see face value, Japan isn't very big, but on look-through, it was really big. So Japan was in the role back then, but it was nowhere as extreme. The second is to look at how China's production of manufactured intermediates rose rapidly worldwide and is now dominant. So this is manufactured intermediate production, percent of the whole world production, and you can see China went in 1995 from... Uh, not much more than 5%, to now producing more than all the developed countries put together. It peaked at 45% of all world production of intermediate goods. And that was very, very rapid. It wasn't as rapid overall, so China really has a comparative advantage in intermediate goods. I'll skip this slide. Now the shocks. Shocks, we don't do much empirics, but we're suggesting an organizing framework. Again, because I, I think the profession is just really starting to engage in this. So we focus on um, two, so three sources of shocks and two types of shocks. There's supplied shocks, demand shocks, and connectivity shocks, which is transportation and communication. These are not mutually exclusive, and they're contagious. The second is idiosyncratic versus systemic. And in our opinion, the big change in this whole area is that it used to be most of the shocks were idiosyncratic and therefore could be left to be dealt with at a firm level. And they did. They had risk, supply chain risk managers. Some were recently seeing some systemic risks, which means many sectors, many countries over long periods of time, where you potentially don't want to leave it to the individual firm to deal with that, especially in certain sectors. So this three sources, two sectors, makes a matrix, which I, we give a lot of examples in there. Interesting research question is, where's the line in the sand? And I think it's worthwhile thinking of, as we just did with financial institutions, which are systematic, and um, that's my mother calling, I guess. <laughs> okay, organizing framework, not an empirical framework. So should you or should you not have policy on this? The first thing is it's not a Puguvian wedge. 
because this is about risk, not externality. It's a perception of risk. And what we did in a, a paper published last year was take the standard portfolio analysis thing and apply it to this. Now, I'm at a business school, so on the vertical axis, it's risk, and I do not have to tell you what the units are. It's risk. And on the horizontal <laughs> ask, it's reward, which are cost savings. And so the perceived reward frontier bows up, as usual, because there's a trade-off between risk and cost reduction. And there's an indifference curve there where the companies decide where to go. So P is where the private sector decides to trade off cost reduction versus increased risk. But potentially, especially in some sectors, the public may have a different perspective of risk and therefore choose S, creating the wedge, which is about risk per perception. Now, we did that, and a lot of people ask us, well, what's in the wedge? And we've been thinking about that. We've, we speculate on it. And I, I would just go with the analogies. The analogies are there are two sectors around the world where countries have never relied on the private sector to deal with risk correctly, and that's farms and arms. I hope you I worked a long time on that. So. <laughs> or agricultural and military equipment, if you want to say it that way. But it's because if something goes wrong in the farms or the arms, you can't rely, expect farmers to have taken the things they need to avoid famine and the social implications of famine. And I think some of the systemic shocks have switched some industries, like semiconductors, into the farms and arms. And that's really what's, what's changed. So all of a sudden, okay, what goes into the wage? We said that. Takeaway, foreign supply chain exposure, bigger but not that big. That would be the kind of follow-up. It's bigger than as commonly measures suggest, but only 12% on aggregate across all the manufacturing. Now, the trouble, of course, is that supply chain disruptions do not happen in the aggregate. They happen in specific industries where these numbers can be radically more extreme. Uh, so one point about that is supply chain, foreign supply chain dependence is not a macro issue for the United States, but it may very well be for medical supplies, electric batteries, semiconductors, and stuff like that. So it should be whatever policy goes on should be pointed at the sector, maybe even the product level. And uh, thank you there for listening. Our first discussant is Penny Goldberg. Uh, so thank you very much for the opportunity to discuss this very interesting paper. Um, many of you may remember that uh, in the last Brookings conference, I presented a paper on a very uh, closely related topic, joined with Tristan Reed. So the topic is uh, close to my heart. And uh, just to uh, uh, remind you briefly, one of the questions that we raised in that presentation was how, how do we increase resilience? And we suggested that in order to make progress, we need to start by defining what resilience is. And we proposed one definition that actually Marcus Brunemeyer put forward, namely bend but not break. He gave the example of reed versus oak. And then we talked about the fact that we need to operationalize it and benchmark it. And this is not something that economists can do by themselves. This takes uh, society as a whole. Um, and uh, uh, finally, once we have these this, um, uh, foundations in place, we need to discuss how we can measure it. So against this background, uh, the contribution of this paper is on the measurement side. It's an important contribution, an important measurement exercise. Um, Richard talked about uh, shocks at the very end. So uh, just briefly, my take would be that, that we, in order to make progress on measurement, we need to first have resolved items one and two. We need to have a clear idea what we need to measure and why. And uh, so I would uh, start with the taxonomy of shocks that uh, 
Richard put forward, and there are many commonalities between the taxonomy he presented and the one we presented uh, last uh, in the last conference. This is from our paper last time, and I won't go through it in the interest of time, but I want to emphasize two issues that are going to be important in my discussion. One is the time horizon. When we think about resilience, are we talking about resilience within this week, which actually may be the right time horizon if we are thinking about medical supplies, or are we talking about longer time horizons, which may be more relevant if we think about getting a new car. Um, what's the level of aggregation? So do we care about one particular plant or what particular firm closing down in response to a shock or about the aggregate economy? Uh, there are no clear answers to these questions, but we have to be, in our minds, we have to be clear what we are after before we measure it. So as I said, the contribution of this paper is on measurement. And uh, uh, my comments, uh, so, so it's, it's very well explained in the paper. And there's also, I have to say, there's a companion paper, an NBR working paper that explains the measurement exercise in great detail. And I don't have uh, comments on the measurement, which is very well done and very uh, valuable. But what I want to focus my discussion is on the implications of this measurement, first for trade policy evaluation and then for the question of resilience. So just briefly, what is the measurement exercise? So Richard explained it very well, but essentially what the paper does is measuring the share of each country in intermediate um, imports uh, in the United States. And there is an important distinction between the face value imports, so this is the direct bilateral imports, and the look-through measure, and these are the imports you get, the dependence you get if you take into account the entire input-output structure. For the latter, you need inter-country input-output tables. You need to have information about the input-output relationships for the entire world. And the main drawback of the um, input-output tables uh, is that they're only available at a very aggregate level. And again, the authors are very, very clear about that. Uh, so in the paper, we have 17 manufacturing sectors. Um, the main message of the paper is China is much bigger than we would think based on the face uh, value measure. And not only that, it has been growing very fast. So if we compare 1995 to 2018, the share of China has increased substantially. Uh, in terms of putting this exercise in the context of the literature, uh, for those of you who are not familiar, one might wonder why do we need another GVC measure? There has been a very extensive literature on measuring um, GVCs actually in trade. And the answer is because most of the measures, and I completely agree with, with what Richard said and what the paper said, most of these measures were focused on measuring backward or inward integration, on measuring the net value of trade. They were not focused on measuring the exposure of the domestic economy. Um, as a side note, one interesting aspect of the, of the old literature is one of its motivations was to show that China was not as important as people thought in terms of trade, that in gross terms, China was very important, but in net terms, actually, China was not as important as people thought. And these days, when we conduct these exercises, the motivation is the exact opposite, namely to show that dependence on China has increased substantially. So it's a very different uh, point of view. So that as background, uh, the, the main value of the results um, in, in terms of policy, um, uh, or the, my, 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 uh, my take on the value of the results, is that we can debate what exactly they mean for resilience, but they do imply that a complete de-Chinification of the U.S. economy may be very costly, if not impossible. Um, I think one of the most valuable uh, uh, applications of the, of the, of the measurement uh, is uh, uh, the implications it has for evaluating trade policy. And let me give you a specific uh, example coming from the U.S.-China trade war. So the U.S. imposed tariffs on China, uh, presumably to reduce Chinese exports to the U.S. There has been a lot of work that showed that uh, these tariffs did, to a certain extent, achieve their objective in the sense that they reduced bilateral trade between these two countries. I have some work um, uh, on that topic, but also there is a more recent paper by Alfaro and Chor. They presented in Jackson Hole uh, this past August, and there they look at even more recent data, so data that include the latest sanctions that the U.S. has imposed, not sanctions, uh, export restrictions that the U.S. has imposed vis-a-vis -vis China, and they do find that the bilateral trade between these two countries, the bilateral imports from China to the U.S. have decreased sharply. Now, if I take the author's results into account, then I would question these results. 
Why? Because they suggest that the dependence on China may not have been reduced as much as these face value measures suggest. So take the example of Vietnam, for example. Uh, as uh, Chinese exporters face higher, higher tariffs, there is substitution in the U.S. towards Vietnam. We started importing more goods from Vietnam. But now what the author's results suggest is that in order to produce these Vietnamese products, the Vietnamese need to use Chinese intermediates. This is a different argument from the one that people initially made, that the Chinese can simply reroute their exports through Vietnam. This is not rerouting. This is just the point that in order to produce products in Vietnam, you need to use Chinese intermediates. So if that's the case, then a, a, an increase in imports from Vietnam may indirectly increase imports from China. And whether this is important or not, I don't quite know. I have to say in our work, we did not find that uh, Chinese global exports increased as a result of, of, of the trade war. But we did find, I have to say, some very unexpected and, and strange patterns when it came to the reaction of global trade flows to the U.S. trade war. And you can only make sense of these patterns if you took all the input-output relations into account. So I think this is a very important area for research, and, and um, I'm, very, I'm very pleased to see someone working on it. Um, I think it would be also very, and I suggested that to the authors, there will be new data coming out very soon, and it would be great to repeat the exercise with the more recent data that it will take into account the, the recent uh, actions of the United States vis-a-vis -vis China and vice versa, and see what this face, uh, I'm sorry, this look-through measures look like now. Th there is one caveat, and there is nothing to, to be done about that, but it's one thing that's uh, uh, worth keeping in mind, that the sectoral level may be too aggregate to capture some of the interesting action. And, and, and just to give you one example, De Gortari has one paper on the Mexican automobile industry, and then he shows that the percentage of intermediates coming from one particular country may be very specific to the particular product the country produces and to, to which destination this product is exported. So, for example, Mexican exports of cars to the U.S., using on average 74% of U.S. value added, Mexican exports to Germany um, use only 18% of U.S. value added. So there is the, the input relationships are very specific to the particular product. Uh, now, the implications of resilience, and uh, I mentioned those because this is one of the motivations of the paper, and more generally, this is one of the issues of great concern these days. Um, one of the key figures in the paper is figure 2.3, and there the authors mentioned that the look-through share of China in U.S. manufacturing inputs is 3.5% on average. Uh, it's as high as 6.3% in textiles. Is this high? Uh, this is one case where the need for a benchmark becomes apparent, and this is why I mentioned that at the outset of my discussion, that without having a benchmark in mind, it's not easy to make sense of these numbers. Um, second point, uh, the import shares are not a sufficient statistic for uh, dependence or resilience. Th they can serve as a red flag, so it's very important to have this information, but they are not sufficient by themselves. And here I think the, the issues are very analogous to issues that come up these days uh, in the discussion about competition. And there is a, a, a certain tension between IO economies who emphasize that Herfindel index and market shares are not a sufficient statistic for competition. They're a red flag, but we need more. Uh, what we really need is substitution elasticities on the demand side uh, and supply elasticities at a very micro level. And, and these are going to depend on the aggregation level. So I would argue that at a very disaggregate level, Many relationships, many production technologies are Leontiev. Uh, substitu substitutability could be much higher at a higher level, and it could also be higher depending on your time horizon. And again, this is why the time horizon and the level of aggregation are important. Um, when it, the issues we, we are concerned about these days, uh, I would argue most of the policy issues uh, that are related to resilience often play out at a much, much more granular level than at the uh, sectoral level uh, of the analysis. And let me give you three examples. So the first example comes from the second discussions, ben, Ben's paper in the AR, 
Um, it's a great paper, by the way. And he, they start the paper by giving a very specific example of a Lyon TF relationship, namely Airbus A380 uses um, one particular engine produced by Rolls-Royce. If, if Rolls-Royce has um, a disruption, they cannot substitute, at least not in the short run, towards another engine. Now, someone might, uh, might say, well, this is something that affects Airbus. Is that an issue that should worry all of us? And in that particular case, I would argue that given that the aerospace industry is an international duopoly with Airbus on one hand and Boeing on the other, it's an issue that's important not just for Airbus, but also for the U.S. and the world as a whole. So again, it depends on the context. Second example, semiconductors. Why are we all concerned about, about Taiwan? If you look at the import shares or export shares of Taiwan, they are truly tiny. So one might wonder, why do we care about Taiwan? Well, it turns out that 92% of advanced logic capacity, so these are chips, semiconductor chips that are less than 10 nanometers, 92% of those are produced in one company in Taiwan, and the other 8% are produced in Korea. So, and these are an important input for advanced semiconductor chips. So again... Uh, we are concerned here about a very specific relationship that plays out at a very granular level. Um, smartphones is another example, and here let me just show you briefly one graph that comes from another paper by uh, Tan, Taglioni, Sturgeon, and Dallas. And this is a paper that, in which they introduce a new term, uh, supermodularity. And what they mean by that, that if you have something like a smartphone, a mobile phone, it consists of many different components. Each of these components, each of these modules, if you want, consists of other modules. Each of these modules is produced in a different country. Um, the, the production is highly concentrated with different countries specializing. So you can see from this graph, very briefly, the blue refers to the United States. So the United States is still very important. You can hardly see Taiwan in this graph. Taiwan is in green. It's tiny, but again, it's very important. Korea is in orange. Korea is very important. So uh, there are two takeaways from this graph. The one is, one is that for any specific component, there is enormous concentration and good reasons to be very concerned about resilience. But if you take the product as a whole, you need all countries to cooperate in order to produce this product. This is precisely the reason that the United States has so much power in, exposing ex in imposing export restrictions vis-a-vis -vis -vis the Chinese uh, right now, we may not be producing semiconductors in the United States anymore, but the United States is very important in design, in software development, in specialized capital equipment. So the United States is as important as, as China in the production of, of these semiconductors. So um, again, I'm, I'm, I'll, I'm concluding since my time is up. Um, uh, I will come back to what I, I said initially when I started the discussion, namely that resilience cannot be evaluated without reference to a specific shock. So let me, you know, for now, let me accept the claim that the U.S. is highly dependent on China at face value. What does this imply for resilience? So uh, the authors argue that systemic shocks have become more important than perhaps this is, this is the case. And by systemic shock, I will... I will uh, 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 understand the shock that affects many sectors in the Chinese economy in this case. Now, what does this mean in this context? So uh, China is a very large country. It's very unlikely that a, nat a natural disaster or something that's truly ex exogenous to policy affects the whole country at once. Even COVID affected different parts of China at different times. On the other hand, a policy-made shock, so a geopolitical shock, it's very likely to affect the country as a whole. But the main takeaway from the author's results is that in that case, uh, it would be very hard to, um, to, to, to become resilient or independent from China precisely because we have all these international interdependencies. So if, we, if the US wanted to decouple from China, it would have to also decouple from Vietnam because Vietnam is importing from China. So uh, my uh, interpretation or Rather, my, my, I'll skip this one. My, my policy, uh, uh, the main policy message I get out of these results is that uh, they suggest that uh, A, there is room for international cooperation, and B, such international cooperation 
is uh, more important than ever precisely because we have all these uh, interdependencies. Finally, from a research point of view, uh, I think it would be, uh, it, it's, a, it's an important first step towards understanding all these input-output relationships, but it would be great if we could complement this study with case studies of individual sectors or individual products so we can understand these relationships that um, are often Leontief uh, at, a, at a granular level. And I will stop here. Thank you very much. Our second discussant is uh, Ben Golub. Thank you very much. Thank you to the organizers uh, for having this very exciting session. Um, and to Richard and Penny for the paper and discussion. Um, so there's a bit of a Freudian slip in my, uh, I misread the title and I thought, they, it does say reliance, but I thought of it as resilience and they go together. Um, I think the paper offers an extremely useful taxonomy of how to think about volatility and resilience. Uh, so the perspective is that the economy is a network of links, um, connected by links. Those links propagate shocks, and then there can be policies or interventions that respond to those shocks, either prospectively or after the fact. And so you can think of the links as very classically as Leontief would have, uh, just as input requirements, or we can expand the view a little bit and recognize that uh, the links between firms happen in this fabric of the world logistics system. And you can correspondingly think of logistical shocks. And then even a little more broadly, or at least differently, uh, re commercial relationships are embedded, as the economic sociologists remind us, uh, in relational contracts and things like that. And that's another fabric to think about uh, that's subject to institutional shocks. And so. The perspective I'm going to try to offer in this discussion is that first, even thinking very classically, just in terms of the green stuff, there are new fundamental macro and microeconomic questions about how to think about resilience responding to exactly the issues that Penny raised about disaggregation. And uh, I think they're surprisingly simple things that we really need to get a grip on. And then when we think a little more broadly uh, this, about these other factors, there's fundamental conceptual questions about how to put connectivity into the aggregate production function that I, I also think we just need to confront you know, b from a variety of different perspectives. So that's the big picture I want to offer. Okay, so the Leontief picture of the economy is that it's uh, at the industry level. It, it, it is an industry level picture in Leontief's original conception, and, you have, and the arrows are supply relationships, so chips go into cars and so do resins. Uh, and this picture, and then the paper very usefully breaks down the picture and the look-through implied exposures at the country level beyond industry. Um, now, a very standard criticism of the Leontief approach is that it, I mean, sometimes people, what, what I think of Leontief economics is much broader than the Leontief production function, but even so, people think there's something very rigid about this way of thinking. So in the Russian energy case, we'll hear a lot more about this tomorrow, if you just did naive Leontief accounting, you might have thought that Germany was very exposed to certain uh, Russian energy sectors. And then at the end of the day, as, as e economists very successfully argued, that was not true. And um, the, it was because the Leontief approach understates the substitution possibilities of the economy. Uh, and I think modern network macro, supply network macro, has been extremely successful at both modeling and then measuring and quantifying this effect. So modern Leontief economics can, can deal with this very well. There's a, I'm going to make sort of the polar opposite criticism, is a, which is very consistent with what Penny was saying, that the real, the, another problem with Leontief is that it ignores certain rigidities that are first order on the time scale of like a quarter. So customization is a big part of how um, firms get their, their parts. And there's good evidence, uh, I think Baro and Sauvignat is a fantastic paper with great evidence, and there's been a lot more since, that on time horizons like a quarter or two, firms really get hurt by the disruption of a supplier, even if in principle there's more of that stuff out there. It just takes time to um, substitute away. And in this sense, the Leontief aggregation aggregate, aggregates away a lot of what is first order for the short-run resilience issues. And so let me do the disaggregation stuff in a picture, and this follows kind of some... Uh, an argument that we qualitatively make that you know, I'll write in my contribution here, but also is in this paper that I'm citing. Um, if we look at cars, you know, when the New York Times goes to document uh, a disruption 
in the car sector, it'll seek out some particular car producer or plant, and that plant will have difficulty getting uh, the particular chips that it's supposed to get, the, its little tendril of that big supply arrow. Uh, and the reason it's having difficulty getting it is because all of the potential suppliers, the people it can call up and say, hey, do you have chips for me, uh, might not be available. So there's these potential suppliers, and in a given short time period, they might be there for you or not. And so some of these links will be active. And this is really kind of an extensive margin thing. At a given time, it's on or off. It's not like you can... Um, you should think of this as in a very averaged or smooth way. Uh, and of course, once we recognize that you know, the chip manufacturer, we could draw a very sim similar picture continuing from the chip manufacturer. So if you do that, but then you kind of focus on cars you, and you take away these blobs, you get a picture like this. And so there, you know, Richard was saying is, the, is the, this f e economist's proper picture, is it a matrix or maybe it's a table? I actually think it's sort of like a tree. I don't think cycles, we should be thinking about cycles too much here because once you're fine enough, you're not going to go back to cars ever, right? But the, the dependence will branch further, and chips will depend on other produced inputs and so forth, as Penny said. And so um, the key things in this picture are that there are several kinds of essential inputs that go in at every stage of production. And so there's a huge complementarity, and since Kramer's O-rings, we've known that nested complementarities, this I just learned this word supermodularity, that can be extremely dramatic for um, things like you know, sensitivity and productivity. This, and, but now we have the O-ring picture kind of on steroids because the dependence nests. Uh, but, you know, there's a mitigating, there's a, a, a counterforce, which is that there's substitution possibilities. You might, you hopefully have like two ways to get chips, and so uh, at least two ways. And so, you know, who knows whether the complementarities or the, or the cushions will win. Um, but my real point is that this is, the, my, this is the picture that's really key for like the COVID shock resilience issues, and we really care about the shape of these things, um, whether we're in the more fan shape or as we were talking about, just in, as Penny was talking about in the case of Taiwan, you know, a lot of the numbers that uh, the paper, Richard, Richard's paper reports, uh, are about um, the possibility, the fear, that these things might ultimately, this, you know, you, your sourcing might look very diverse, and at the end you're funneling in on a very small number of Taiwanese semiconductor producers. Um, so the shapes matter. The aggregated evidence is very suggestive about them. Leontief accounting is very useful and suggestive, and I think this paper is super important because people aren't, we need to say these basic things. But at the same time, and I think this is the main theoretical point of the, of the paper uh, with Elliot and Leduc that I have, is that if you first do aggregation and then you try to study fragility, you're going to get it very wrong, or at least very different from doing it in the other order. If you study the microeconomics of fragility, uh, you know, you should do it at the disaggregated level. Then you might ask, what do the aggregate data that you can access tell you about what's going on? But the veil that you need to look under is the veil, you know, in we see that industry level picture in the aggregate numbers, but what we're ultimately curious about for short run resilience is this picture and we need to somehow learn to think about it. Um, and, if, and then uh, the shock issues, right? Implicit in the China reliance discussion is some theory of the shock structure. is it, it must be an aggregate, really China index shock that we're worried about, as Penny said. And I, I actually think, you know, exposure modeling, exposure mapping is very useful, but, not, is, but really needs shock modeling as a complement, a, a detailed and explicit account of why you are worrying about reliance at some level, like the country level. And it must be that we're worried about Chinese geopolitical shocks, we are. Um, but I guess I want to point out that, you know, in some of these fan structures, if your reliance on China went way, went way up, but the way it went up is that every, every sourcing relationship now has a U.S. or a European and a Chinese source. That seems like it's pretty good for resilience, right? So the, the way, the distribution of how the country labels map into these pictures is really important. Um, all right, so I love sort of getting toward my, getting toward the last point I want to make. Um, I love the taxonomy of shocks in this paper. Systemic versus idiosyncratic times supply-demand connectivity. Let me point out that if any economist in this room were asked to model a supply shock in a context something like this, we would all reach for the same sort of concepts and models, and maybe a little less so, but similarly for demand. And if I ask you to model a connectivity shock, I think the standard economist response is like a question mark popping up above your head. What is that? Uh, um, an example that I love that's very eloquently discussed in the paper 
is that during COVID, there was this big demand shock to, to electronics. People wanted more exercise machines and TVs. The world logistics system got stressed trying to make and ship all those things. Uh, and as a result, there was congestion um, and other logistics problems, containers getting piled up in the wrong place that affected all shipping links, even ones that had nothing to do with the exercise machines. And so that's a specific channel from a demand shock to a connectivity shock, but it kind of occurs to me that we don't really have great abstractions, certainly not canonical macroeconomic abstractions uh, that we're familiar with for putting that in, in the models. Now, you might, the COVID shock is fairly anomalous, but it seems like it alerts us to things we need to learn to think about maybe for other things, and I think this highlights that we lack a good tool here, a good conceptual tool for the kind of thinking we need to do. So um, that's what, to summarize, I think what I want to say is that the real supply network happens at the firm level, not at the aggregate level that we're able to document. Uh, and that's exciting for uh, nerdy people because uh, you get to see the aggregate level. It's very interesting to ask what moments of the aggregate data can be used to illuminate the structure I've argued is so important. You kind of need to learn to read off of aggregate uh, data about inter-industry relationships, maybe things about uh, intertemporal volatility, things like that, to tell you something about the distribution of those trees that you can never really see, but that I claim are, are, very, are very important. Um, and then we need concepts, uh, and I think this is sort of where it's open season, like what is connectivity really? Where is it in the aggregate production function? And what are the first order feedbacks with the other parts, other things we do know how to talk about, which this COVID story I told you is like a, a first example of. To close with a, a goofy metaphor, um, in neuroscience, um, so I just claim that I think we need an abstraction to think about connectivity shocks. We need to know what the connectivity shocks are happening to. Uh, communication and transportation is a great start, and that's not all of it because it misses some of the institution stuff. And, uh, but in neuroscience, the connectome, uh, you know, from my five minutes on Wikipedia, uh, is an abstraction that at the finest level does have... Uh, do, is able to talk about not just the production function of the brain, but also the tissue that connects the whole thing. And I think we need to build towards something more like that uh, in economics. That's what I want to say. Thanks so much. Okay, before I uh, take some questions, I just wanted to say for the people that are on Zoom, um, if you want to participate, uh, you should raise your hand. Okay, so let me start with Sebnem. Um, this is working, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, very, very interesting paper. I would like to go uh, um, exact to that point Ben and Penny Day mo both made. So this, how you are more the on TF at this aggregate level, more substitution at the aggregate level, but this interacts with the timing, right? I mean, for macroeconomists, a business cycle frequency, a quarter, uh, you know, versus three, four years is also very important. And in fact, one of the things we learned during COVID is exactly that, right? I mean, even things that are, might be substitutable at an aggregate level in the long run may not be in, in couple quarters. And that impacts domestic macro aggregates we care about, such as inflation. So what are you, your views on that? So should we be also doing from more micro to macro exactly for the reason to tie it to things like you know, inflation, unemployment, and all these things macro people care about, or um, you know, a certain level of aggregation will be, will be enough. Tarek. Oh. Okay. Um, so I wanted to, uh, so both discussants brought up the, the issue of, sho of shock modeling. So oh, oh, no, now it works. Okay. So both, both discussants brought up the issue of shock modeling. So very few shocks are, we can no longer get anything from China. Uh, and I think kind of COVID is a great example of like it was a very complicated shock that applied to different firms at different times in different ways. Um, and uh, so one possible way of monitoring these shocks is by looking at what firm executives tell financial markets of what they're dealing with. And in particular, during COVID, I had kind of this bizarre experience where it's like playing with earnings calls. And, you know, in June of 2020, you saw, you know, Unilever and final goods manufacturers were reporting we have supply chain problems. And then, you know, in September, it was consumer durables. And then after that, it was industrials. And I was emailing, like, the CEA and, like, you know, we need to do something. Like that. So my point is there is firm quarter-level data about executives reporting specific problems where you can first 
look at what is the impact and then also the, the severity of the propagation over time. David Romer. Uh, two comments. One's uh, an econ one question. In, in a lot of the work on supply chains, there's either a, an implicit tone or sort of explicit statement that supply chains aren't resilient enough. And the econ one question is, what's the market failure? The first model one would write down is Aero de Bro, where the price of wheat in a famine is, you know, that's, that's the right price. And there's no, you know, famines are bad, but there's no cause for government intervention to make us more resilient to famines. There are obviously more complicated models. There are these, there's clearly a lot of imperfect competition, bilateral monopoly going on. I don't see an obvious presumption that the privately supplied amount of resilience is, is systematically less. Like, I, was, I think I could pretty easily write down a model where Airbus is really concerned about preserving its monopoly rents and so is overly, and so has too much resilience relative to what a social planner would, would be. So I think, I think we need more, before we go to policy, we need more attention to, to, micro, to micro theory. Um, obviously, China is different because that's, a, that's a potentially a national defense is, issue. Um, second question is, I, I have a lot of, I don't understand um, sort of gross trade flow measures. And uh, I'm going to think of the following. Suppose you've been writing this paper 10 years ago, where there are three of you, and every night one of you works on the paper and emails it to the next person, and it goes around. Is gross intra-UK trade from the two UK authors and then trade between Switzerland and the UK, is that an absolutely phenomenal number where it's kind of 100 you know, or a thousand times the, the total value of the paper because it gets emailed back and forth uh, a thousand times. It seems like logically it is, but you wouldn't, that would be a terrible measure. So I, my question is, what, what, what are we trying to accomplish when we're measuring things? So it's sort of, I, and I, I don't have an answer to that. It just puzzles me. Yvonne Warning. Thank you. D wonderful presentation and discussions. Underscoring David's uh, comment first, saying, I, I really feel like this is a paper that needs uh, a model, but that will come, and maybe they'll be able to use these moments. Uh, but I think many of the comments are in that spirit. So I, I think of it as, here's a moment in the data, and we'll figure out how to use this. But we will need those models, I think, as, as was said. Uh, a second more uh, simple comment is, I think at, at the heart, maybe it's not being said very explicitly, it's the geopolitical risk. And if that's the case, I really want, think it would be interesting to think the counterpart measure for China, how dependent are they and how resilient are they? Because kind of like a Cold War thinking, if we're both dependent on each other, you know, maybe things are different than if we're dependent, but they aren't. And of course, I, I look forward to things, thinking of allies and and it started to think about those those kind of issues. Thanks. Jason? Um, my question was also about policy. Richard, I think you made the argument that the rationale for policy is that you'll take too much risk because of the perception that you'll be bailed out. The question is, to the degree the government takes an interest in resilience, it's basically saying, we're going to bail you out and could that be perverse and lead to more risk taking um, as a result? You know, in what cases will it force you to move down the risk reward thing to the better place? In what case will it change your preferences and make you want to move up the risk reward thing and leave us worse off as a result? Martin Bailey. A uh, couple of small points. Um, number one, I think quite a bit of the um, uh, supply chain difficulties in the COVID pandemic was because of the big shift from uh, services to goods during that uh, that time. So that actually there was also a big shift in the nature of uh, demand, not just on the production side, although there were sh problems on the production side from, from China, certainly. Uh, my second point is that there, there's a couple of things that apparently I thought I knew uh, and now I don't know anymore based on uh, what you were telling me. So the first thing I thought I knew is that we shouldn't worry about China trade because they do tend to do low value stuff. Uh, so the value added is much lower than the gross trade and the gross trade that is what tends to get reported in the newspapers is a huge exaggeration 
of the importance of uh, China to trade or the threat to the US or whatever. And so now uh, you're suggesting that sort of the look through um, or the gross trade or the trade is actually uh, crucial and it certainly makes me think about it. So if what the Chinese do is, is assemble things, so they assemble an iPhone, all the high-tech parts come, come from Japan or Korea or the United States or whatever and they put it all together in the, in the factory. But presumably that gives them a good deal of power because they're the last uh, uh, producer to actually hold the the finished item, and so they could create a lot of disruption in, in the U.S. So I think that means I have to rethink uh, thinking about uh, the importance of, of China. And uh, similar, and this goes back a bit, maybe even further, so one of the things I thought I knew was that the Japanese um, were smarter in certain ways in manuf about manufacturing than U.S. companies. Um, because uh, Japanese companies formed keiritsu and they formed close relationships with their suppliers and typically they had one uh, supplier and they would work with that supplier to improve quality and Im improve productivity and that's why Toyota had much higher productivity than uh, General Motors whereas General Motors had a very arm's length relationship and insisted on having at least two and maybe more uh, suppliers and they weren't sort of feeding back information to those suppliers, and so they weren't helping them to improve their uh, productivity. But uh, uh, now I think you're, you're suggesting that that single supplier uh, model, uh, maybe it's okay if it's a Keiretsu when it's located next door, but uh, if it's located in another country, particularly presumably a country that you're not quite confident about its stability, although some countries may be more stable than the U.S. these days, but anyway, some, uh, some country that you're worried about uh, their supply, uh, then you maybe want to think about having two suppliers, uh, even if that dilutes uh, a bit some of the strength that you might get from working directly with your suppliers. Henry Aaron. Uh, nobody has yet mentioned the word inventories uh, as an explicit way of dealing with risk. Uh, they come with a cost, and in some cases they're impossible to build up. You can't stockpile goods that have not yet been invented, which uh, is a problem in technologically very dynamic industries like semiconductors. But in a large swath of the economy, inventories are a possibility. I think there are good decision theory reasons why private calculations about the value of inventories will understate the social value of inventories. And there may be, for that reason, a basis for intervening to encourage more inventory holding. But uh, the first step is to know the degree to which, uh, what the costs are of carrying inventories uh, uh, across the uh, manufacturing or industrial spectrum, which I presume varies enormously from product to product. So I'm posing an empirical question here uh, not in any way commenting or criticizing the presentations, which I thought were excellent. John Heltwinger. So I, I wanted to raise the question that there may be issues with the timeliness of the source data for the I.O. Uh, data. So for those of you who follow BA closely, they released comprehensive revisions today uh, on, on the GDP accounts, so all brand new GDP accounts. Not complete, but this is the first time the economic census from 2017 has been used in the GDP accounts. Up till yesterday, every number out of the United States in the I.O. accounts was through the 2012 economic census. Lots of extrapolation from there. So I, I, I'm, I'm very sympathetic with the, all the issues brought up to today, but I, I worry about whether some of the aggregate data is just, just too old. And then the question is, what can we do about it? Derek Zachman. Hi, um, so when, uh, Georg Zachmann from Bruegel. Um, when the question is about measuring the uh, the impact of a political shock on the on the aggregate economy, I wonder whether one should 
more strongly take into account the heterogeneity of, um, of the companies that are the users of the input. So if you have a very heterogeneous set of companies, some of them very productive, some of them very unproductive with the corresponding inputs, you might essentially lose then the, the further production that is yeah, very low value added in the US, but the significant share of, uh, uh, of the value added is still being produced with much less of the input. That's a bit the experience that we had in Europe with the gas shock, where essentially the heterogeneity of the users was a very strong buffer to the, uh, to the crisis. Elaine Buchberg. So thank you. I think this is a, a good contribution in terms of economics reflecting how industrial companies think about their supply chains as well as getting a lot of the qualitative information right. And um, as many of you know, I worked in the auto industry for a number of years. And, and you do think four layers down in your supply chain, the better resourced you are, the more you know about your supply chain in the private sector isn't monolithic, how you manage your supply chain is a big competitive advantage. So it's something you compete on from whether you decide to rely on multiple sourcing or inventory and how well you can scramble um, in the event of something, including putting the machine tools on a plane and moving them somewhere else. Um, in terms of thinking about shocks, I think it's more important to think about the duration of shocks than their sources. Because what really matters in terms of your ability to get through it is how long it lasts, regardless what causes it. So let me take three more questions and then turn it over to the authors. Uh, Wendy Edelberg. So my working hypothesis uh, for, for why we might need policy interventions to create more resilience or basically impose uh, more resilience on firms has been twofold. One, these risks are somewhat new, um, or the, the increase in risks is somewhat new, the geopolitical risks are somewhat new, and the, the acceleration in climate-related risks is somewhat new, but more significant. Um, what I understand from empirical work on management is that managers are particularly penalized when they do worse relative to their peers which is a good reason why you would underinsure, because in good times, you're just systematically going to be pulling in you know, lower profits than your peers. And then on the flip side, managers are not particularly penalized when they do poorly in the midst of aggregate shocks. So it, it seems like there's a reason just in terms of a manager's incentives to underinsure and that policy can help just get to a different equilibrium. Hoyt Buckley. Thanks. So as has been said, the usefulness of these measures are higher when you have a, a rigid production process, but I, I put that against a fact. I'll call it a fact. It's really more made up, but it's probably true, which is if you look a generation ago uh, and you think about mainland China, less Hong Kong, these numbers, be it the, the sort of the direct or the induced measures, are going to be so close to zero as to not worth having a conference about, right? Uh, and so that, to me, suggests there's, at some time horizon, a pretty high degree of elasticity of substitution. Um, so if we're talking about long-term policies like de-Chinification, that suggests uh, a, an easier road for this. Um, thank you. Robert Gordon. I had a question, really a puzzle, uh, to throw out to the authors, the discussants, or anyone else. Uh, and that is when you put together two different phenomena. The first one is the Chinification, the China shock, that we've heard today takes the form not only of finished manufactured goods, but also of intermediate manufactured goods. The second fact is the astounding zero growth in U.S. manufacturing productivity over the period since 2010. And that in continues through the pandemic and into 2023. Um, now, my puzzle is I don't quite see the connection. Is there a connection between uh, Chinese intermediate imports and the lack of U.S. productivity? I would have thought, like Martin Bailey, that the Chinese imports tended to be uh, skewed toward low value added uh, products, uh, 
uh, and they would replace American firms that were producing relatively low productivity uh, products. And if you knock out the low productivity part of the economy, then the remainder should be higher productivity, and so it should go in the opposite direction. Uh, the China shock should have raised U.S. manufacturing productivity growth instead of reducing it. Uh, so I'm looking for a connection and can't find one. Okay, let me turn it over to the authors. Okay, thank you very much. Let's see, okay. So the way we're going to do this, I'm going to talk about the discussants and I'm going to turn it over to my colleagues for all the hard questions that you want to, and if, and if you guys run out of ammunition, I'll, I'll come back and uh, fill out the time. So first of all, I, want, I really want to thank both Penny and Ben for excellent uh, discussion, not just on this draft, but the first draft, which made it much better, much more structured. A lot of the comments you made uh, reflected in the paper, and so it, it, we really thank about that. So um, with uh, Penny, I want to thank you for bringing up the many caveats that, were, uh, that need to be raised when you're using input-output analysis, and, and Ben mentioned some other, and other people around the room have mentioned many of them. There are many caveats to them, and you just got to keep it in mind of what, it, what it is. And for instance, the ONTF, that does not allow substitution, but uh, you can kind of wave your hands, it's this or that. Um, and so thank you for bringing that up, Penny. And, and also, uh, you, you mentioned a lot of the important literature that's been going on, many uh, studies of this, many of them using face value measures, which, which we didn't have time to discuss, but they, they are in the papers. I mean, it's, it's probably in general worthwhile saying that ultimately what you need is some sort of computable general equilibrium model to simulate these things when you allow substitutability between geographic origin and between products. But then you get into one of these massive things which spits out our numbers and you don't really understand what's going on, but that's basically, I think, where you gotta go when you wanna take the step beyond. So the way we think about these measures is a first order approximation of where there might be a problem. Uh, whether dependence is very high, that would suggest that it's worthwhile more investigating more. It's not really that this is, a, if, it's, if our measure is high, it is risky, and if it's not, it's not. Uh, but I think it, uh, it's like a, a warning, warning sign for that. Um, for Ben, I want to thank him for a great summary of the paper. It's so annoying when your discussants summarize your paper better than you did, uh, more effectively. But uh, thank you very much for that. We'll, we'll adopt it into the paper. Um, the second thing is uh, I really like the way he plumbed into the source of the shocks. We just put them into supply, demand, and connectivity shocks, and he spent a long time on the connectivity. But the, the supply shocks have many different things. Could be strikes, could be productivity shocks, it could be a, a tornado, we, we don't know. So I think it, ultimately you wanna go down to the fundamental source of the shock. But when you think about policy, often this three-way uh, connection thing is useful. And one of the things we, we didn't put into the paper is some sort of rough mapping between possible mitigating policies and these types of shocks. So the only one, it was mentioned, the only one that works for all of them is stock holding. Whether it's a demand shock, supply shock, it always works. And many countries have adopted that. For instance, the Strategic Petroleum Reserve is exactly that. In Switzerland, where I uh, I'm, uh, live, um, the government subsidizes all the retailers to hold extra stock in particular products, which are named, which I'm very disappointed was recently chocolate was taken off of that list. <laughs> but, um, you know, toilet paper, there was no shortage, uh, masks, no, no, there was no shortage like that because the Swiss government subsidizes them to keep them. The Swiss are very, very paranoid about being cut off. Um, but, you know, geodiversification of supplies, that only works if you're thinking about supply shocks, if it's actually a big demand shock, that doesn't help. And also bringing everything to home may not make it less risky, it might make it more risky. And diversifying uh, transportation networks might be important if the shocks are to connectivity. So I think w these baskets are useful for thinking about which policies should be used to fix what potential shocks. And I totally agree with the cost. You have to do the costs and benefits before you actually do anything. And my, my, my main assumption is that you wouldn't do much except for a very few products, but that's. So um, also what, what I really liked about Ben's presentation is essentially digging down into network externalities. So these things, it's a matrix. And a matrix has a lot of information 
that isn't necessarily summarized by one number, the Leontief inverse, for instance. And the exact shape of it can be very important. There's, and the, like the shape of the thing, you, you make it more fragile, single points of, of failure and all that sort of stuff. So I think that's, that's really important to dig down more deeply into the matrix using other measures. Uh, and uh, we, we, just, we just used one, but I think it's a very, um, a very promising thing and, and using some of his work to think harder about which of these shapes or which of these things are more important, not just how much is foreign and how much is domestic. So with that, I will pass it on. I don't know how you guys are. All right, so first of all, um, just I would like to echo Richard's thank you uh, to the organizers and all of the participants here for the, the amazing opportunity to sit here today. Um, there's been really great questions and I'm going to structure my replies um, kind of into three parts. So first is to talk about the supply chain measures themselves and some of the issues that were raised. Then to kind of circle back on policy and there's been questions raised about, you know, how can we really get to the right policies. And then finally, um, there was a question about China and you know, how does China look relative to the United States or some other countries as well. So um, Penny raised some really great points uh, and others as well about the coarseness of the input output data and also points on the timeliness of this data. So I think it's you know, a first order importance to acknowledge that those, um, those issues definitely exist. And they exist because in order to create this you know, global input output structure, uh, international organizations and academic institutions that put these tables together need to do lots of uh, like grunt work of you know translating supply and use tables, concording products so that they can all fit together, and um, all of that takes time. Different countries have data availability that come out uh, at different points in time as well. So. I think you know the main advantage of the different measures that we put forward is actually to give like this bigger bird's eye view of what's going on in differences between face value trade and look through trade. And then as Penny had suggested, and we do a little bit of this in the paper as well, is to really go down into the product level. And so we do that for the United States looking at the total economy, but we also look in, in particular at the automotive sector. And there's two kind of important caveats about the product level data and the input output data allows us to circumvent that. The first is that when you look at product level data, you don't actually know which sector is importing a given good. So you see, you know, the U.S. imports sunflower seed oil, but is that going into, um, you know, uh, manufacturing production where that's going to be used as an input, or is that going to a household that uses the sunflower seed oil for cooking? Um, the second is that we don't know if that good is an intermediate good or a final good, and as we've been talking about in the presentation that Richard gave, but also in terms of the whole production network um, discussion today, we absolutely need to know if these goods are being used as intermediates versus final. But with those kind of two caveats um, in mind and alongside the timeliness issue, we can then use these um, kind of global value chain and global supply chain measures in order to kind of look at broader trends and then use that against the product level data in order to, for example, scale things up. And that's kind of the one wow chart that Richard had put forward. You know, if you're going to remember one number, remember that the U.S. is four times more dependent on China than face value statistics would let you know. So we can see, and this is like the timeliness point, that you know, over time that trend has been increasing. And if it's been increasing fairly steadily, even if we don't have the latest data because of all of the issues that come together putting those, um, those global input output tables out, we can kind of use those trends as a benchmark. Um, the second is about policy, and uh, I think there was a really important point that was raised um, about, you know, the, uh, the distinction between the duration of shocks versus their sources. And here in the paper, we also kind of try to address this by highlighting a distinction between resilience, which we've talked a lot about today, but also robustness. And sometimes in the economic debate, these two terms get used interchangeably. But we try to really um, distinguish between the two by saying that resilience is, you know, how long would it take you to bounce back after a crisis? And uh, robustness in terms of, you know, in where and in which areas can we not fail? 
Um, so I've gotten the, the two-minute sign. I'll just move on to the last point that I'd like to make, which is about China um, specifically, and that it has actually a very asymmetric role in global supply chains. And so this is um, not only brought about in the current paper, but also in the companion paper um, that led to this Brookings work. Um, and what we show in that paper is that all major manufacturing uh, countries are highly dependent on China. They source at least 2% of their total inputs, uh, domestic and foreign, from China. But China's role actually has declined. And if you look at the trends um, over time, you see China has built up its industrial base as kind of the major world supplier of industrial inputs, but it's also sourcing those inputs uh, in its own economy, um, you know, domestically. So um, I'll pass it over to Angelos if there's further comments, and thank you again. So um, thanks again, and thank you for having us here today. I think my responses will not be as structured as to um, my authors, but I'll touch upon a few points that I wrote down. Um, I'll start in reverse order. I mean, one point that was mentioned earlier is that even if you look at case studies where they have big firms, they actually have no clue what's going on to their tier two suppliers. In most cases, they know their tier one suppliers or tier two, but then they have no visibility. But then all of them are still exposed and reliant to these suppliers. So what we try to say here, even at the aggregate level, countries and industries are exposed to um, not only your direct sourcing, uh, not directly to your suppliers, you know, like one level up, but there's also this whole network that we need to take into account. And I mean, it's very trivial, and most of people would think about it, but. Here we say there's one way that we could measure it. And it's been there for a very long time, but we try to put it in a trade perspective such that we have a very good, or we believe we have a very good first order approximation with all the caveats that have been mentioned earlier. Now there's been um, discussions about time horizon, heterogeneity, and so on. And what I want to say here is that all also boils back to the point of penny, that we need also to sit down and try to think what is the definition of um, um, exposure resilience and whatever we want to have in place because this is the important bit then we can start structuring things down so I also got a zero sign here and um, at the end of the day the, the main takeaway from that is that there is a network out there that we need to be thinking of instead of just you know like who is directly um, behind us or just in front of us so thank you very much okay let's break until 4 p.m.
Okay, uh, let's let's get seated and get started again. Are the slides okay? Yes. Yeah. Okay, oh, so... Wait, sorry, the slides are not there. Yeah, so I was... <laughs> ah, okay, here we go. Okay, now, now we're good. All right, so our last paper for the afternoon is uh, Global Transmission of Fed Hikes, the Role of Policy Credibility and Balance Sheets, and Shabnam Kalemli Ozgan is going to present. Take it away. Thank you very much for inviting us to this amazing conference. Uh, this is joint work with uh, Phyllis Unsal, who is at uh, IMF and uh, right now on leave at OECD. So the usual disclaimer applies. These are our own views and do not represent the views of the IMF and uh, or OECD. So our paper is on uh, global transmission of Fed hikes. And let me start by uh, stating the obvious that this is an international paper. We are going to be thinking about international transmission of U.S. monetary policy, a topic uh, dear to my heart that I have been working uh, over uh, the last uh, decade or so. Now, the starting point, of course, the fact that Fed went through its most rapid hiking cycle of the last 40 years, as we all know very well, in less than a two-year period of time, Fed increased interest rate 5.5 percentage points. Now, historically, these type of episodes are associated with crisis and contractions in emerging markets and developing economies. There are many, but I'm going to throw out some famous examples here that you are probably all familiar with. Latin American debt crisis associated with Volcker's disinflation in 70s and 80s. Asian crisis uh, started in 97, but of course what led to it is the 1994 Fed hike. And then last but not least, May 2013, Ben Bernanke's speech in terms of Fed uh, is going to start tightening led to what is known as taper tantrum. So far in the last two years, we have not seen nothing of the sort. Yes, there might be some problem in certain countries, some slowdown, but we have not witnessed any major crisis, financial crisis or any major contraction in emerging markets and developing economies, especially emerging markets. So what we would like to do in this paper is to ask this very simple question, why this time is different? To be able to answer this question, we are going to proceed in four steps. First, we are going to revisit the historical evidence, so historical episode of Fed hikes. And we are going to show you that the adverse effects associated with Fed hikes, especially on emerging markets, come from the financial channel of U.S. monetary policy transmission and not the trade channel. In fact, trade channel is supposed to act as a smoother, as a smoothing factor to the Fed hike. Second, we try to understand the underlying reason for this, and we are going to show you that the sensitivity of the risk tolerance of global financial investors uh, is very important. This is sensitive to U.S. monetary policy. Risk tolerance of global investors goes down than Fed hikes. So what does this mean? This is a risk of sentiment that is going to lead to shedding risky assets. And emerging markets, of course, one of the most riskiest asset class. So the financial jargon for this is known as dollar comes home effect. The other side of this, as we have witnessed in 2008 and after, when Fed pursued quantitative easing policies, was search for yield effect. So dollar goes to search for yield to emerging markets, and then dollar comes home. So we dig deeper, and we try to understand why emerging markets is a risky asset class. I'm sure everyone in this room is going to come up with a reason, and this list can be very long. But I'm going to tell you, and I'm going to try to convince you that we identify two very important factors behind that being a risky asset class as an emerging market. One of them is going to be high dollar debt, and high dollar debt is something that is going to lead to weak balance sheets through currency mismatch, especially in non-financial private sector, corporate sector, and household sector. And the second factor is going to be lack of monetary policy credibility. And finally, we are going to tie everything together by looking at the recent period, 
Fed started hiking March 2022. We are going to start looking from 2021 onwards and show you that the resilience of the emerging markets comes from reduced level of dollar debt and increased monetary policy credibility. How are we going to end up with that conclusion? Because one very good measure of risk premium that global financial investors prices risk in for emerging markets is not going to move as much this time around, whereas in the historical episode, this risk premium moved a lot when Fed hike, especially for countries with a lot of dollar debt and for countries who lack monetary policy credibility. Let me start with this narrative of two countries that you all know, and it's going to be very important uh, for us to tell the story because these are the countries that are going to be under a trade agreement with the United States, Mexico and Canada. Two closest neighbors of the United States, they are under a trade agreement, trade patterns are similar, so you would expect trade channel to work similarly for Mexico and Canada. They are both small open economies. So what is different between Mexico and Canada? Canada is an advanced small open economy. Mexico is an emerging market. In fact, one of the things that we underline in the paper, it's very important to differentiate emerging markets. And we cannot treat countries like Mexico and Canada, Switzerland and Turkey, uh, Chile and uh, um, Germany the same way. So this is Mexico and Canada during taper tantrum. Remember, taper tantrum is... Uh, affiliated with Ben Bernanke's speech in May 2013 in terms of the upcoming Fed tightening. I'm going to show you here, starting the second quarter of 2013, in the first graph, the exchange rate. You can see that this is normal exchange rate of Mexican peso vis-a-vis -vis the dollar and Canadian dollar vis-a-vis -vis the dollar. They are both depreciating, very similar amounts. Okay, so that's what we would expect. Fed is hiking or signals hiking. The currencies uh, depreciate similarly. What is different between Mexico and Canada, this is color-coded, Mexico is red, Canada is blue, is the risk spreads. The middle figure is going to show you the long-term risk spreads with 10-year government bonds. You see the Mexico goes up, Canada goes down. And the last figure shows the short-term risk spreads measured as the UIP premium, UIP risk premium. UIP is uncovered interest parity condition. It's a very important international arbitrage condition. It simply tells you the return to currencies should be the same once you take into account the exchange rate changes. Okay? So you read a higher UIP is risky currency, excess returns to that currency. So in this figure, when you see the red going up, that means Mexico peso is a risky currency. Investors are expecting higher returns to hold that currency, to invest in that currency, as opposed to Canada, as you see, this is not happening. So dial forward, we come now today, that's the bottom figure, and why I put them together. All the y-axis are same scale here, so you can compare the magnitudes. So you see that, first of all, the exchange rate, so the bottom left, behaves very differently. This time, um, you know, some depreciation in, in Canadian dollar, but actually, Mexican peso appreciates vis-a-vis -vis the uh, US dollar. The spreads are very similar. If you look at the mid, uh, bottom mid, the 10-year government bond spreads in Mexico and Canada, they both go down. And the UIP deviation, you know, kind of around constant, a little bit increase in Canada, but Mexico go down. Very, very different behavior of the risk this time around compared to taper tantrum. We are going to show you that this is not just about Mexico and Canada, but this is a systematic pattern across emerging markets, and the pattern is going to be linked to these two factors I told you about monetary policy credibility, and dollar debt. So let me tell you how we are going to measure these things. So monetary policy credibility index is a new index that is going to come from the paper by my co-author, Phyllis Unsal, and her co-authors at the fund. They call it IPOC. They uh, follow a very st similar strategy to no Romer and Romer, narrative approach, and they went through uh, many, many documents of every country to be able to come up with an index that measures monetary policy credibility at a granular level. What do I mean by that? In general, what is out there when we talk about monetary policy credibility of emerging markets, it's a classification. So this index moves away from an exchange rate classification, like pegging or floating, or a monetary policy classification, like you are an inflation targeting or not. This is not what this index is doing. This index is a narrative approach based index that looks uh, to the monetary policy practices uh, uh, among, along three pillars. And these pillars are going to be independence and accountability, IA, policy and operational strategy, PO, and communication, C. That's why this index is called IPOC. So we are going to be using this to measure 
the, the monetary policy, the credibility of emerging markets. Second, effect stat. So effect stat is going to be mostly in dollars, uh, and this is going to, uh, we are going to focus on the non-financial private sector. So we are going to be focusing on corporates and households, and the data is going to come from the BIS. Um, let me tell you why we do this. I mean, those of us in the room who work with the FX that uh, I see Tarek and Hoyt here, we know how difficult this is to get data on this. Because think about it, central banks have to report this. They don't report it. They don't report it to IMF. They report to BIS, but you have to be a BIS uh, a member country, and they have all the incentive not to report it. They might be reporting in their financial stability reports. Then you have to go and, and you track it down. So it is actually a difficult variable to measure. Uh, and, uh, you know, there are a lot of measures out there, but they are not real exposures. For example, you can use the estimates that are widely used and available for many countries, but those are going to be estimates based on current account and net foreign liabilities. And it's going to be mixed and matched local currency and foreign currency borrowing. So we don't want to do that. We want to focus on real exposure. Second, we want to be able to separate sectors because certain sectors are going to be regulated to hedge the currency risk. In emerging markets, this is going to be the banks. Because of the, all the crisis happening in emerging markets, now their financial sector is under heavy regulation where there won't be any currency risk. So you don't want to mix that with the sectors truly exposed to currency risk, such as the corporate sector. And finally, emerging market governments recently, I mean, pretty much the last decade or so, start borrowing in their own currency, right? So this is kind of known as graduation from the original sin documented by Barry Ihangreen and Ricardo Hausman originally. So we also don't want to mix that. So we are going to focus on where the real vulnerability is on hedge foreign currency debt exposure where that, that is mostly going to be in U.S. dollars in corporates and households. Okay. So let me show you how these things look like. So on the left, you see the Monetary Policy Credibility Index. This index is going to start in 2007. The blue is advanced countries, average and median. Red is emerging markets, average and median, and you see the improvements in both uh, the median and average emerging market. On the right, you see the foreign currency debt. Now, you might expect to see a huge downward trend in foreign currency debt. You don't see this, unfortunately, because it starts in 2000 because of our uh, detail on focusing the right data and high-quality data. But I would like you to uh, focus on the y-axis and look at those numbers. Those numbers, both as a share of GDP, the red line, or as a share of total debt, is below 15%. You know, if you have been, you know, aware of the emerging market crisis in the 70s, 80s, 90s, we are used to see numbers up to 50, 60, 70%. Okay, so in that sense, during this decade, we are going to be operating with very low levels of effects that compared to 80s and 90s. The one way to measure, of course, if our monetary policy credibility in the index capturing the things we care about is look at the relationship between the monetary policy credibility index and inflation expectations and inflation. So what we show you here on the top, short and long-term inflation expectations. On the bottom, actual inflation, both from advanced economies and emerging markets, Emerging markets are going to be red dots, advanced economies blue dots. And we plot inflation expectation inflation against the policy credibility index. You see a very strong negative relationship, higher monetary policy credibility, lower inflation expectation and lower inflation. But look who is driving it. The red dots are driving it, right? Because the relationship for advanced economies is basically flat. They already have credibility. So the, the, the story is really uh, 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 striking uh, the, in terms of the emerging markets. Okay. Let me show you now results, then I will conclude. So we are going to employ a local projections framework. Our data is going to be quarterly frequency starting 1990 quarter one up to 2023 quarter one. We are going to be working with 70 countries, 55 emerging markets and developing economies. When we go and use our monetary policy credibility index, unfortunately, we are only going to have 35 emerging markets. And when we use our foreign currency, that variable, we are going to have 15 emerging markets. Because again, there is going to be a lot of issues uh, in terms of getting this data. Historical episode, when we say historical episode, it, that means 1990 to 2019, end of 2019. And recent episode is 2021 to 20, 2021 Q1 to 2022 Q4. We are going to run both specifications. These are standard local projection specifications. Both are used in the literature. So the first one is just regressing the level of these macro variables. The second one is have a more cumulative effect. 
And the blue is going to be the US monetary policy shock. I will tell you in a minute what, how we are going to measure that. We are going to plot the red beta H as the local projection impulses. And for Y, we are going to look at a series of macrofinance variables, GDP, exchange rate, policy rate, inflation, UIP, uncovered interest parity deviation, capital flows, and so on. And in the control set, we are going to have all the controls you want to, uh, to see. OK, for the US monetary policy shock, again, this is a huge literature. I mean, there is no way I can do justice. Uh, we try several things, but for now, I'm go going to show you results uh, with the gertler karate shocks from their AER paper. This is the quarterly average of three-month Fed fund futures rate, high-frequency identification, looks at 30-minute window around the FOMC announcement. We will also go and use direct measure of risk sentiments. What are those things? VIX, excess bond premium, and the RORO index, risk on, risk off index. Okay, so here is the baseline result historically. So this is what historically what happens. The top red emerging markets, the bottom blue advanced economies. You see that when Fed hikes, the worst effects are on emerging markets. Deeper GDP contraction, higher UIP premium. Higher UIP premium means there is going to be a uh, you know, bigger depreciation, higher risk premium on the emerging market currency. What is interesting is the middle uh, figure. These things happen in spite of the fact that emerging markets actually reducing their policy rate and not mimicking the Fed hike. Then we say, OK, let's use all the sample and not divide by emerging and advanced, but divide as high monetary policy credibility, low monetary policy credibility countries. And you see that these worst effects of Fed hikes come from the low monetary policy credibility countries. Again, on the top, you see a much deeper contraction of GDP, much higher inflation. Of course, low monetary policy credibility, you expect higher inflation as opposed to low inflation for high credibility countries, the bottom. And again, the different responses of the uh, monetary policy. Finally, we also look into high effects debt, low effects debt country. Again, when Fed hikes, the worst effects are going to be concentrated on countries with a lot of uh, effects debt, which means dollar debt. Again, a deeper GDP contraction, much larger uh, depreciation of the currency of that country with high effects debt, and again, higher risk premium captured here by the excess currency returns UIP. Recent episode, I'm going to show you only the UIP deviation, the exchange rate is there, and also the other variables, but of course we are going to be limited with the fact that we only have eight quarters to work with in a local projections framework where we need a lot of lags. So uh, please bear with me to show you these two figures. So historically, UIP premium, which is again the risk premium on the emerging markets, can go as high as three percentage point for a one percentage point Fed hike. This is a huge, huge amount. Okay, given the UIP's distribution. So you, this is like, you know, you go from a country that does everything properly, like Chile, you go to a country like Turkey and Argentina. Okay, so it's, it's, it's a big effect. Recently, it is half of that. And in the other specification, it is completely in, in, insignificant. So the UIP premium, the risk premium on the emerging markets charged by global investors when Fed hikes, nowhere raised as much during this time around for the same one percentage point Fed hike. To conclude... Let me summarize. So the archetypal emerging market crisis is the Asian crisis. It goes from 97 to 02 at the footsteps of the 1994 Fed hike and uh, go on. So when Fed raised rates, pulling capital back to US, Thailand's currency peg broke, leading to a panic that spread to several countries, including coming back home to the US to the Wall Street hedge fund LTCM. A decade later, in 2013, there was an EM sell-off this has happened even if it didn't start tightening. They just signaled tightening in May 2013. 2022, 2023, nothing happened like that. This time is different. So we try to understand this uh, issue in this paper, and we show that financial channel of international transmission was less strong this time around relative to the historical episodes. This is because of improved monetary policy credibility and lower effects that. How do we tie these uh, results? Because lower effects debt and high credibility means lower risk premium, as I showed in the historical episodes, and this is at the heart of the financial channel. I would like to finish with this quote from Gita Gopinath, first deputy managing director of IMF. IMF is an institution where this question, why emerging markets showed resilience, basically at the top of their agenda. This is from her speech in South Africa this month. I quote, in the current high for long environment, 
global financial conditions for emerging markets can be expected to remain challenging. We are not out of the woods yet. Despite sharply raising U.S. rates, emerging markets have demonstrated resilience. Though inflation in emerging markets rose, inflation expectations remain anchored. These outcomes owe much to improvements many EMs made to their policy frameworks and financial sectors during last decades. Central bank independence, inflation targeting, exchange rate flexibility, regulation of the financial sectors all played a critical role. Thank you very much. Our first discussant is uh, Kristen Forbes. Okay, thank you very much. So there is a lot in this paper. It tackles a very important question. Why are uh, emerging markets on general, um, and let me just say, I'm going to talk about emerging market resilience. What I mean is emerging markets, on average, or median emerging markets, some are in trouble. Think Argentina's turkeys. Developing countries are under a lot of stress in much of the world and having trouble repaying their debts as interest rates go up. But it, it, putting that aside for now, the main question is why are emerging markets, on average, or most of the group, much more resilient than they traditionally are to sharp increases in U.S. interest rates. And that's captured in, this is an article from The Economist recently, why are emerging markets coping so well despite rate shocks and a series of other shocks that have hit the world? Um, why is this the world today instead of something like this? This is a picture from The Economist in 2013 during the taper tantrum when just the talk of ending asset purchases, forget even raising interest rates, meant capital flows to emerging markets dried up and went down the drain here in this picture. Why are we in such a different world today? So very, very important question. Important to understand if this can last. Will emerging markets remain resilient, especially as rate hikes are, or rates are expected to stay high for an extended period? Um, and it would be great if we could understand exactly why. This could have important insights for other countries. What should they focus on to build resilience to the next shocks that will inevitably come? So that's the key theme of the paper. What I'm going to do in my comments is try to focus on three things. First, a quick summary of the paper with a few editorial comments inserted, as there's a lot to say. Uh, then I'm going to put the, con the paper in a broader context of emerging market resilience, and then finally end with some concerns on the data and estimation to hopefully improve the paper for the next draft. So let's start with a quick summary. Uh, First, the paper begins with a section, a long section on relevant literature, frames the focus of the paper, and motivates why they're going to focus on the financial channels through which shocks hit emerging markets and through which they've built resilience. So I think that makes a lot of sense. That's where there's been a lot of good work recently, including by the authors on the financial transmission channels of shocks and risk shocks. Uh, but one thing that did bother me a little, maybe I'm a little old-fashioned, is it really dismisses any role of trade, any role of commodity prices. And as we just saw in the last session, I don't know if the authors did this on purpose, you know, there's been a lot going on in trade in the world, um, in particular a lot going on in commodities. So if the focus is understanding resilience in 2021, 2022, that's when commodity prices spiked. Different countries were hit quite differently by some of the trade shocks. Um, and if you look at the sample that's the focus of some of the key parts of the paper, many of the emerging markets are major commodity exporters. So it's not surprising they're resilient. It could just be because commodity prices went up too. Um, I don't think that's the whole story, but it's something we shouldn't just completely ignore. It should be in the mix somewhere, not just dismissed. Then the next major set of the, uh, part of the paper talks about the two key uh, data or two key variables that are central to the paper, central to the focus on monetary policy credibility and FX exposure. Um, these two data, uh, data series are really nice contributions. It's really the focus of the paper. I'm going to talk more about them in a few minutes. But um, my big frustration as a discussant is the data is confidential, and they couldn't even share them with me. And since so much of the paper hinges on these new data sets that you can't look at, um, I just wish I could get a better sense of what that data is, because it does really drive everything that's going on and what the focus is. Um, but I'll talk more about that later. Um, third, main bulk of the paper is the estimation. And here they spend a lot of time on how they estimate monetary policy shocks. I'm going to leave that to Gian Maria to talk about. Um, but then they estimate the impact of monetary policy shocks, and then they use these shocks to monetary policy to estimate the impact 
on um, six variables, on GDP, CPI, policy, interest rate, exchange rate, UIP deviations, and capital inflows. And then they simulate the effect for three different subsets of the countries in the sample. So estimate the impact on monetary shocks on those six variables for emerging markets versus advanced economies. For emerging markets with more credibility versus emerging markets with less credibility. And then for emerging markets with more FX exposure and then emerging markets with less FX exposure. Bottom line, that's a lot of results, and that's just the central part. And then they do all sorts of sensitivity tests. So there's a lot of graphs in there, a lot of pictures. Um, some of it, I'm going to admit, makes a lot of sense. It's what you expect. Some of it, I couldn't quite get my head around why, why this, why not that. Some of the graphs go up, down, up, down, up, down. I'm not quite sure why you get Ws. Um, so I think it would be nice to have a little more structure ahead of time. Here's what we expect. Here's what we got. Here's what's a little odd. Here's why. Um, it is just a lot to absorb. Um, and I think some of the strange results might be related to sample issues, which I'll talk about more in a minute. But then this all builds up to the punchline. Where we're going is why are emerging markets more resilient today? Um, did improved credibility, monetary policy credibility, and reduced FX exposure explain this improved resilience? Uh, and the result is yes, that's the punchline. Uh, my frustration with the paper, though, is that's really the big buildup. That's what you want to take away. But it's really only a couple pages, and they really can't do too much, which isn't really their fault. There just hasn't been enough time yet. You need more quarters of data using the estimation approach they have with a limited sample size. So I think the result is probably right. I think um, improved policy credibility and reduced FX exposure is part of the story. Um, but it's really hard to tease it out of the data with this approach right now. So I'm looking forward to the next draft, and some of them just said they're getting a couple more quarters of data soon, so I think that will really strengthen this key punchline of the paper. Okay, so that's the overview. Let me put this in a broader context. The key focus is the recent resilience of emerging markets. Um, and it really has been remarkable how emerging markets, on average, again, middle-income countries, on average, are doing much better than one would expect, especially in the face of what's happened with interest rates. This is um, a graph of interest rates in major advanced economies. They have gone up quite quickly um, to levels no one was expecting not that long ago. Just to put this in context, in January of 2021, market expectations Expectations were that the first rate hike of the U.S. would be in May of 2024. So we wouldn't have even started yet. Uh, in May, January of 2021, market expectations that the terminal rate, so the highest level U.S. rates would get at the peak of this hiking cycle, would be 0.85, not even 1%. Fast forward, okay, so that changed pretty quickly. January 2022. Emerging markets were already hiking by then. Market expectations were the peak U.S. rate would be about one and three quarters. Fast forward again to even June of 22. Um, by then, the U.S. was hiking. The U.S. had already realized it was behind. They'd already hiked 50 basis points. And market expectations, so about a year ago, were the peak U.S. rate would be 3%. We're at about 5.5% now. So there's been a huge monetary policy surprise. That's not going to be captured when you look at the minute before a meeting and the minute after, um, but just big picture relative to what people were expecting when they were taking on debt and borrowing and making other macro decisions, rates are a lot, lot higher now than anyone was predicted, and they've gotten there a lot, lot faster than anyone was expecting. So this is a major shock. And that's where the resilience of emerging markets really is resilient, given this change in the external borrowing environment. Um, but I think it's also important to put this resilience in a bigger context. This isn't just improved resilience we've seen over the last couple of years. Emerging markets have actually been more resilient for a while based on a number of measures. It's not just the last couple of years. Um, you could argue even it's almost the last, maybe not quite a decade, five years, 10 years. You might even argue 15 years based on what your measure is. Let me just show you a couple examples of this. Um, if you look at sudden stops in capital flows to emerging markets. So this uses a methodology I developed over a decade ago with Frank Warnock, where we look at um, drivers of capital flows from abroad into emerging markets. And here we show the share of emerging markets that have a sudden stop, a sudden uh, reduction in capital flows from abroad that generally creates a whole host of challenges. 
Um, you see, historically, it doesn't take much, and a large share of emerging markets experience a sudden stop, which is then correlated with, again, a whole set of issues. Um, but when COVID hit, um, in many, according to some measure, big risk offshock, bigger risk offshock than many of these other episodes, um, only a small share of emerging markets experience a sudden stop. Capital flows were quite a bit more resilient to a major risk off shock in freezing up of global capital markets. Um, just another example, I could give you many of them, but I'll stop after this one. Um, look at emerging markets' ability to use counter cyclical policy in the face of shocks. Um, one of the characteristics of emerging markets in the 80s and 70s was when you hit a big negative shock, they often had to respond by raising interest rates and they couldn't use expansionary fiscal policy because they had to support capital inflows and build confidence. Um, this graph is uh, something from a project I did with Katarina Bergan at the IMF where we look at the response of emerging markets to the global financial crisis in gray and the COVID in uh, red. We look at the first six months of each episode. You see that when COVID hit, emerging markets couldn't loosen fiscal policy, couldn't really loosen monetary policy on average, had to use a lot of exchange rate reserves to support their exchange rates. When COVID hit, in some ways an even bigger shock, they could expand fiscal policy, lower interest rates on average, and didn't have to use many reserves. And actually, a few months later, they were accumulating reserves as capital flows increased. So emerging markets have been more resilient, more able to use counter-cyclical fiscal policy for a while now. It's not just the last couple of years. Um, so why? What's, what explains this increased resilience? Is it because many emerging markets have smaller capital, uh, current account deficits? Uh, that was a big focus of the taper tantrum. Countries that were hit had large current account deficits. Some have gone down. Gross global capital flows have decreased as some of the more volatile flows, especially between banks, have decreased quite dramatically since 2008. Many country emerging markets have built up international reserve stockpiles, provides a buffer, helps them stabilize the exchange rate, and avoids some of the negative effects on um, FX mismatch. Um, macroprudential regulations have been tightened around the world. Uh, the graph on the right shows an index. Uh, the red is tightening in macroprudential regulations in emerging markets. That's made financial systems safer, stronger, less likely to amplify shocks from abroad through the financial sister on, system onto the broader economy. And other explanations are improved central bank credibility and reduced share of borrowing in foreign exchange. So lots of things have probably contributed to improved resilience. This paper focuses on the last two. Not to say that those aren't important. I think they are part of the story. But I think it is important to realize it's probably part of a bigger story and a lot going on and a lot of changes in the global financial system. Okay, so that's the big picture context. So am I convinced that the last two variables that the paper focuses on are the key variables driving improved resilience? Um, again, I think they're important, but to be really convincing, um, the few things I'd like to see in the next draft of the paper. Um, first, data. So central data of the paper is this new measure of monetary policy credibility. I think this is an exciting variable. Anyone who works on anything in this area, you always want a measure of monetary policy credibility. It's really hard to get. It's not out there. Um, hopefully, this will be publicly available at some point. It'd be a really nice addition to people working in the space. Um, but it is frustrating because you don't really know what's going on if you can't see the data. Um, they did in this draft. I asked them for more information. They gave me some charts and some information, which so it looks logical, looks like a good variable. But there's also some questions, like it shows increased monetary policy credibility of some different countries. Um, couldn't help but highlight Turkey, uh, knowing where the author is from. Uh, Turkey shows an improvement in monetary policy credibility. Um, but the later part of this period is when the government of Turkey started to put a lot of pressure on the central bank to keep interest rates low. That's when the rotation of you know new central bank head every year or less started. So if that's improved credibility, they must have been starting from a really low starting point. And you just sort of wonder what's going on in some of these measures. I, hopefully we can see the data at some point, because again, it's central to the paper. Um, but the data that worries me most is the one on FX exposure. Um, the key measure they focus on is US dollar debt to total debt in the non-financial private sector. That's the graph on the right she showed us. Um, but what worries me is the key argument is this has gone down. But it really looks like actually this FX exposure has gone up by this measure. Um, I, my sense is other measures I've seen that it has gone down, especially over a longer time period. But again, it'd be nice to really better understand what's going on if this is central to the argument. If FX exposure has actually gone up recently during this period of improved resilience, the whole argument breaks down. So we've got to get a better sense of what's going on here. And seeing the data would help. 
Also, this data is pretty limited. It doesn't include FX exposure of the non-financial sector, which is where there's been a lot of research showing as tighter macroprudential regulation shifts far into the non-financial private sector. That's where a lot of the FX exposure is going. That's gone up quite a bit in a number of countries. So that's not on in here. Exposure to the banking sector, most banks are well hedged, but many are, all are not. Um, exposure to other FX um, other than dollars. And then overall exposure, not just as a share of total debt. Um, not sure all, which of these measures is better or worse, but you should see some sensitivity tests, at least of these. But my biggest concern with this data is it's really limited. Well, I'd like to see you push to use some other measures. My count, there's only about 13 or 14 emerging markets that have coverage on FS exposure. Um, and those countries that actually have data are different than the other countries that don't have data, no surprise. Um, but then if you take 13, 14 countries, split them in half, estimate this model that needs lots of lags, and then like six or seven countries, if you split it in the middle, less if you don't split it in the middle, you've just got tiny samples. Um, and that's why I think um, you might get some of these funky patterns in some of these graphs. It could be driven by having an Argentina or a Turkey out of your sample of six. You get some odd patterns. The sample's just tiny. Um, and then, finally, when you do all this small sample, look at the impact of U.S. Fed hikes over the last couple of years. You really have a tiny sample. The Fed actually began hiking in March of 2022. The sample ends in the fourth quarter, 22. So you've only got three quarters of rate hikes, six countries. It's just not enough data to estimate these things. So the, the authors do realize this. They know they're short data. Um, so they start the hiking window in 2021. But that's when no one thought the Fed was even going to hike, rate, or hike rates until 2024. Um, so it's just it's um, it's not the author's fault. They just don't. There's not enough data in there to estimate this well. Um, finally, um, I guess I have to tie up, but the other big issue is I worry about omitted variables. If you look at, the, say, there's 13 countries, 13, 14, with data on FX exposure and credibility, split the sample in half. I'm guessing the countries at the top right, low credibility, high FX exposure, your Argentinas, your Turkeys. Um, and then those countries behave differently in terms of GDP, exchange rate, inflation, et cetera. But my guess is if you um, change the axis and said those are countries with weak institutional credibility, high current account deficits, low FX reserves, pick your variable, you'd have a pretty sim similar sample split. So you're not really quite sure what's the variable causing these different patterns. The countries on the top left are just different than the Chile's and Korea's on the bottom right. So to tie up... Um, emerging markets have coped quite well to uh, recent hikes in U.S. interest rates. Um, it really is a positive story of resilience, and I do agree with the author's bottom line. I think part of the story is that emerging markets have done a lot of good things, including reduced FX exposure, built central bank credibility, um, and I think that's part of the story, but I think I'm still not, if I came in with different priors, I'm not sure I'd be completely convinced that's the whole story. Um, and I think there probably are other factors at play. So my last comment, just for fun, on a lighter note. So to sum up, I spent some time with uh, AI the other night and asked them to create an image of emerging market resilience. And that's what's on the right. I said, create a hocus-eyes wave crashing down, but have a spectator at a safe distance on the beach in a yellow slicker protected from the water and protected by rocks to capture the emerging markets that are more resilient to the great wave of higher U.S. interest rates. So that's the final image. It works pretty well. So emerging markets look a little more resilient, safer. But let me show you my first try what the AI popped out. <laughs> so, so I'm not quite sure if this is a sign that AI isn't quite ready for uh, game time yet, or if AI is way ahead of us and is warning us that we still have some big risks that have yet to emerge for emerging markets. Thank you. <laughs> Our second discussion is Jean Maria Melesi Ferretti. So, thank you first to Jan and John for having me here. I've been a huge fan of the <clears throat> Brookings papers uh, since my first year of grad school. I was subscribing, as I think probably student-subsidized rates back, back at the time. Um, 
And it's also uh, a real pleasure to discuss a paper by uh, two friends that I've actually known since the very, very beginning of their careers. I remember meeting Shebnam when she was a junior, junior, junior faculty at Houston, uh, really, I think, just out of grad school. And uh, Felice actually worked in my division at the IMF when she was uh, in the economist program. So uh, they've come a really long way, and this is a very interesting paper. So really happy to have this opportunity to discuss it. So main question, we've gone through it. A very nice presentation, a very good discussion, and a very nice summary also by Christine. Um, of the two big questions, uh, how have EMDs coped with U.S. monetary policy tightening over the past three decades? Well, we know historically uh, EMDs are more vulnerable uh, to U.S. monetary policy tightening than advanced economies. I think there is no discussion on that. And they've done surprisingly well in the latest episodes. I think that's, that's also a sensible answer. And, of course, the follow-up question is uh, how come and uh, strength of monetary policy frameworks and reduction in overall effects exposure are what the uh, authors emphasize. So what are the main conclusions from this? Let me first praise you know, this massive uh, data effort that I remember actually uh, Felice was working on a number of years ago um, on new data on central bank frameworks. I think, uh, as Christine, I really hope that these data is, uh, you know, that they will be allowed to make this data uh, public uh, very soon. I do personally find the conclusions of the paper very sensible. Uh, I think the main emerging economies have certainly become much more resilient. They have stronger institutions. That includes, of course, a stronger monetary policy frameworks. That's clearly at play. I think the reduction in FX exposures is very important. Um, I do think, like Christine, and I'm sure like uh, Shednam and Felice, that other correlated factors are likely to matter too in this increased resilience. They're not highlighted as much in the paper. So here I have a really quick summary of my main comments and suggestions. Um, there is some of what I'm asking for is already done in the paper. I think it could be done more. Uh, some is, I think, not uh, fully done. So let me delve into the specifics a little bit more, um, starting with uh, the stability of the pre-COVID period we are looking at taken from two different perspectives, the cross-sectional perspective and the time series perspective. Um, and let me start with the time series perspective. So my take on this, this is out of this, you know, 25 years work with Philip Lane on external positions, composition, probability of crisis and the like, is that this has been an ongoing process that started... Um, probably late 80s, early 90s, uh, but really um, a continuous one with a lot of strengthening that came before the global financial crisis. But the empirical work in the paper treats the 1990-2020 period as one. There is just one stable coefficient on the response of monetary to mon U.S. monetary policy shocks, which is then compared to the tightening period. Now, EM crises have declined very substantially in frequency since the early 2000s, and that includes the global financial crisis and the taper tantrum. Just one observation here. Um, Christine showed a very nice graph on the frequency of sudden stops, uh, and you saw a spike around 2013, 14, 15. But you have to think that the part of what resilience is is becoming more resilient to shocks like a sudden stop. If you actually go to the taper tantrum, you go to the vulnerable five that were the countries uh, more severely affected, India, Indonesia, Brazil, South Africa, Turkey, you look at quarterly GDP, you won't find one single quarter of negative growth 
uh, in 2013 Q2, Q3, Q4. This is not to say that they were not affected. You look at capital flows, you see this was a big shock. But, you know, we talk about that being the, sort of a really bad period for EMs. Think of the most affected countries with not a single quarter of negative growth compared to the catastrophe of the uh, crisis in the 80s and to the Mexican crisis, the Asian crisis of 97. It's just a different order of magnitude. So what is my point? It would be nice to see whether the response to U.S. monetary policy shocks has become different within the long period of the sample. So say, comparing the 1990s to, say, 2004, and the period from 2004 to 2019. We would be that way also able to see whether you have a gradual process of strengthening which would be completely in line with the data that Shebnam showed on the time series of the strengthening of monetary policy frameworks. It's not a jump at the end. It is a continuous period of strengthening. And again, I think it doesn't take anything from the bottom line of the paper because, yes, EMs are more resilient. There's no question. It's just, I think, a process that is a, a little bit longer. And I list there a number of the factors, I think going back a bit to the discussion that Christine had, you have more flexible, that all really go together. More flexible exchange rates, you can have them if you have a stronger monetary policy framework. You have improved, um, sorry for the jargon, improved net international investment position, basically re improving the net position vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world, having more, more liabilities in the form of equity as opposed to debt, accumulating reserves, borrowing more even in debt contracts, borrowing more in domestic currency, all pieces um, that helped uh, increase uh, resilience. Second, uh, now we move to the cross-section. And again, this I was saying there are things that are already in the paper. The paper does do sample splits uh, that reinforce, I think, this argument. But I would still get rid in the work of uh, low-income countries, at least together with the MDEs. Again, what we are doing here is assuming the same response to US monetary policy shocks. I have a lot of problems already thinking that the response is the same in the top tier emerging economies, the Brazils, Mexicos, Indonesias, Indias, uh, South Africas, of the, uh, Chile, Colombias of this world, versus the Pakistan, Egypt, Ghana, uh, that are, have um, less exchange rate flexibility. They may have, be still classified as dirty floating, but are clearly way more vulnerable to uh, these shocks. So, uh, my sense is definitely no uh, um, uh, developing countries or having the developing countries separately. The paper does do this in the robustness, I think, because of this, in, uh, you know, a lot of results that maybe more just focus on, uh, on the pure EM sample would be good. The second observation is on the sample on FX exposure. There was a lot of discussion. So Christine talked quite a bit about the, the, the data. The issue is that the data is only used to split a sample in two. High exposure, low exposure. There is, insofar as I understand it, the data is not used in the empirical work. It is used to classify countries as countries with more exposure or less exposure, and then you run the same you know, uh, pro local projection method on the two samples and derive different impulse responses. For that type of exercise, I think you can use other measures. Um, there is a much broader availability now of currency composition data for net international investment positions and in particular for the debt component that one could use to construct a net FX position vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world. Or there are other proxies that I would be happy to discuss with, with more time. Because I feared, again, as Christine, the sample is very limited. It's 16 nominally, but one is a full peg, Saudi Arabia, so we're at 15. One is advanced an advanced economy, Korea. 
and we are for, uh, 14, and one is Argentina that, you know, is, is a very special case and for quite a bit of the period was a peg. Um, second, uh, another observation is trade channel. Uh, the, I think to put together more the theoretical discussion with the empirics, it would be nice to have a little bit of evidence on how external sector variables respond beyond the behavior of foreign investors. So uh, <coughs> Shebnem documents powerfully the decline in GDP, uh, particularly in the vulnerable, that is concentrated in the more vulnerable countries. It would be nice to know how the external sector works in there. My sense is you have a collapse in investment. Uh, you basically have weakness in domestic demand as global financial conditions tighten, and that is where quite a bit of the action comes. But it would be interesting to see, before dismissing uh, the impact of exchange rates on uh, trade, uh, what is actually the response of uh, real exports and imports. Um, and I also feel, in some cases, the trade channel is a bit caricatured. It is true that uh, you have, in a Mandel Fleming setting, a pure depreciation uh, ha is expansionary. But of course, what it matters what is the shock that causes the depreciation. And clearly, if it's a shock that is contractionary for financial conditions, you're going to get a decline in aggregate demand. But you could still have a positive response of exports, even though the aggregate effect uh, may still, uh, will likely be very negative. Then, latest episode. Now, again, I'm uh, a big uh, believer in increased resilience in EMs, so I don't need to be sold on this uh, particular, uh, on this particular topic. Um, uh, but I would note a couple of things. One is, of course, most EMs had started tightening monetary policy before the U.S. Other factors concurrent with U.S. monetary policy matter, as uh, also Christine stressed, commodity price increases are a big deal, and there was a big global recovery from, from COVID. But the point I wanted to make also is let's not think that the entire... So in terms of aggregate EM GDP, we've clearly done well. But if you count by numbers, you have a lot of second-tier EMs. Second-tier, I don't mean it in any disparaging sense. I mean in terms of uh, global financial integration, in terms of strength of policy frameworks, in terms of level of development. A lot of countries that are really bleeding, uh, let alone the developing world, where you have an enormous number of countries in debt distress. I mean, I think of Sri Lanka among the EMs, which is in default, Egypt, Pakistan, Tunisia, they're not in default, but they are really in a very uh, difficult place. So, yes, it is true that the Brazils, Mexicos, Indias, Indonesias, even Turkey so far have been quite resilient, but there is also a tier of EMs uh, that, and a lot of developing economies that are not coming out of this shock very, very uh, well, it may is clearly not just U.S. monetary policy. There are many other things going on. Some of these are commodity importers, but still, I don't want to. It, it sort of it, it would be good to caveat a bit the you know the, the rosy picture for the entire EM world based on those. Then I have, I think, a really naive observation on measuring U.S. monetary policy shocks, and again, I am not. Uh, you know, an insider into this literature. But I want to pick up on something that Christine said that has to do with what is a surprise in U.S. monetary policy. Now, if you check the graphs on the surprise uh, monetary policy shocks in, in the paper, you barely see a blip of life uh, in 21-22. I'd like to see what you get in 23, but I would be surprised whether you get anything remotely as large as what you see in some other periods. To me, that's, I, I have to think this is missing some part of what the systematic monetary policy tightening does, which may not be expected the day of the Fed meeting, but taken, as Christine was mentioning, six months, a year before, these are huge, huge surprises. So I worry a bit 
about whether we are fully capturing monetary policy tightening uh, with uh, these measures. It is not a criticism. I mean, this is, these are measures that, these are the standard measures to measure the impact of monetary policy shocks. But when you don't look at asset prices and you look at macro variables, I think that a surprise is not just what is a surprise the day of the meeting. A few other points there. One that surprised me, I'll pick on the third, is that on average during this period, and including all these countries that have much less monetary policy autonomy, you still get a loosening of monetary policy in response to US tightening. Uh, again, I tend to believe flexible exchange rates give you monetary policy autonomy, but going that you go in the opposite way of the US, I still find that uh, surprising. Uh, and let me close here. Again, thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to discuss this paper. I think it's very interesting. It needs a bit of work, but I think it has uh, definitely promise for uh, you know, shedding even more light on these issues that are really central to a big part of the world. Thanks a lot. All right, so let's open it up to the floor. Um, Jonathan? Yeah, so uh, just one quick question. The, um, you know, the, the countries under consideration aren't the only ones that have been unusually resilient to the Fed rate hikes, because the U.S. has been really resilient. I was just curious if you think that, well, it has. I just, I, but I was curious, you know, the, the extent to think that matters, because, you know, obviously that's going to have a lot of implications for risk premium, risk sentiment, equity valuations, business investment, foreign direct investment. Um, but it makes you wonder if there's something else going on. Carolyn? So I just um, wanted, uh, thank you very much for the paper. I wanted uh, to get your comments on the role of rising external financing through equity instruments, such as FDI and other types of uh, equity instruments, and whether you think that that may have played a role in resilience. Steve came in. Hi, I enjoyed uh, setting up this paper a lot. And um, I should actually note as an aside that uh, her focus on FX debt is, becomes more understandable to me because she harassed me greatly a couple of years ago when she edited one of her papers for JIE and said, you must put FX debt in the analysis. And we did. Uh, but to, so I agree with the uh, with your main well with your main points that certainly the greater resiliency uh, of um, EMs both in terms of balance sheets and in terms of policy help them to become much more resilient. But there's another factor which actually hasn't been discussed uh, in the room so far, uh, and that has to do with how global financial markets have responded to Fed tightening. Uh, as you've pointed out. One of the ways that Fed tightening spills over to EMEs is by affecting global risk sentiment. Okay, and so ordinarily, you know, and you know, so that you know, so increases in Fed rates, lower risk sentiment, uh, you know, capital outflows from emerging markets, and one of the ways you can see that is looking at U.S. high yield corporate spreads, and they are incredibly well correlated with emerging market dollar bond credit spreads. They move up and down together. And if you look at what's happened to U.S. corporate high yield spreads over the last few years, they have moved up, but not very much. They've pretty much remained range bound, and they are well under the peaks raised during the global financial crisis and again during COVID. So I think that's a very important consideration in terms of thinking about the resilience of emerging markets in the last year. And it also suggests that if U.S. financial conditions were to deteriorate over the next year or two, uh, you know, as the Fed tightening continues, okay, then that could actually lead to a lot of deterioration on the EM front. Thank you. Uh, Icicle? Thank you. Um, I have a naive question following up about, so what, how does this work? Like the U.S. keeps tightening and nothing happens in the U.S. And we still go spend money, we 
travel and we buy commodities, as Kristen talked about. So if we were to enter a recession, will this continue or not? So I'm a bit confused about the transmission mechanism. Is it something real or is it through financial markets? Can you, uh, can you talk to like, the magnitude of these relative factors in terms of transmission? Thank you. Jason? Um, one of the other hypotheses for the lack of spillover was that this one was more of a common shock than previous ones, that other EMs started to raise their rates before us, and that they mostly would have had to raise rates in the same way, even absent this, as opposed to the previous tightening cycles, where they were much less synced up macroeconomically with what was going on in the United States um, and inflation, and so it forced unwanted um, rate increases on them. So one, what do you think of that? And two, is there anything in your modeling and estimation that lets you control for some sort of pooled common shock or time fixed effects or whatever um, that would get at it, or is it all just country by country? Tarek? I had the same question. <laughs> uh, Don Cohn. So I want to pick up on uh, a point that Jason made and uh, Gian Maria's point about earlier tightening. So it does strike me that the shock was the level and persistence of inflation, that a number, that the insulation of a number of these countries came because they acted first before the others. So their central banks recognized the problem before the Federal Reserve recognized the problem and had the independence, perhaps this is the development, right, Sidney, the independence developed over time that they could take that action ahead of time to protect their credibility and, and better insulate their economies. Jordy? Yes, a common criticism of um, the kind of shocks that you use, the Gertler karate shocks, is that they may have, they are not pure exogenous shocks, but they may have an endogenous component. It is related to uh, private you know, information that the central bank has about uh, the prospects for the economy that um, financial markets do not have. So if, this, if the relative importance of the pure exogenous versus endogenous component of those measures has changed over time, maybe because, you know, the Fed has improved in terms of its policy and it randomizes less, no, it's more uh, systematic. Uh, couldn't that explain partly the results? Because, uh, you know, in the more recent period, then uh, um, what is perceived, what your measure, um, you would interpret as, a, as an exogenous tightening of monetary policy, it's actually... Um, reflecting uh, the prospects of um, uh, an improvement in the U.S. economy that may have, you know, through trade links or whatever, lead to an improvement in EM economies. Okay, so let me turn it over to the authors. Uh, all right, so, okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. All right, okay. Great, um, thank you so much, uh, first, uh, Christine and Jean-Maria, uh, for the comments. Um, let me start with the questions, and then uh, I go back to the comments, and then also uh, would like to give a chance to Phyllis to say something about the entire confidentiality and all that <laughs> of those uh, data. Okay, so first of all, I think this, this point is, um, several people made this, uh, Jonathan, Jason, Tarek, Dom. Uh, okay, so the, the issue that well, okay, U.S. is also resilient. Ashagur is also getting back at the same thing. Let me explain this this way. This can easily be that financial conditions this time around, not as tight, okay? So it is really not just about the, the small blip in the U.S. monetary policy shock, but if the, given the U.S. monetary policy shock, how much the variables that measure the global financial conditions, things like VIX and all, how much they tighten, right? So the Fed says they are... They tightened and they are tightening and inflation coming down and you know the 
part of the transmission inflation coming down is the tighter global financial condition. But maybe it wasn't as tight as the, the previous episodes. So with the macro data, we cannot separate these two, right? So, but again, it is really about the channel goes through the risk sentiment of uh, financial investors and how tight the global financial condition is. If for the same amount of hike, we are getting loser conditions there, yes, that, that might be the explanation. But the exercise is comparing the same amount of height, you know, the Fed height now and the Fed height there, uh, then. Uh, the, the monetary policy shock measure being problematic, both Jordi and Jean Maria said this, this is a huge literature, so we don't want to um, take a stand on this literature, but we started using all of them, right? You know, Bauer Swanson, Nakamura Steinson, Gert Karate, so we were using all of them and all these risk sentiment measures too. Uh, the sensitivities can be more important domestically, exactly this point you're making, but internationally actually a lot of these things are going to work the similar way as long as that shock picks up the changes in the risk center. So at the end of the day, you are going to go to the changes in the risk center. So Jean-Marie, it is really not about the, the, the size. If you look at that figure, not every Fed hike, I plot the Fed hikes historically and the uh, risk sentiments, not all of them is going to change the risk sentiments. So you're exactly right. But it's not about the size of the monetary policy check. It is really if the risk sentiments are moving or not. So that's, that's what really drives the channel. And in fact, now we are writing these nonlinear macro models. Even a small shock can move things a lot, including the real macro variables, if, again, the risk sentiments are moving. So in that sense, you know, the story can be very well be one where, you know, this time around, the U.S. has been very resilient, so there wasn't enough increase. There was enough risk off. That can be. But let me also say something else here uh, that um, uh, goes back to this trade channel story. So we are not omitting the trade channel. We are not omitting the commodities. Or we are not omitting anything, right? So let me explain this very clearly because there seems to be a lot of confusion uh, uh, on this. So what we mean with trade channel is expenditure switching. Okay, so the demand in the U.S. is going to go down and demand in Mexico is going to go up because Mexican goods is cheaper. Okay, so that's, that's the trade channel. So trade channel always supposed to work in a smoothing way. Okay, this entire thing rests on the fact that the adverse effects or the bad things come from the financial channel. That's the premise. It's not that we are ignoring. So we control current account, capital account, you know, all those things. And if, if trade is helping smooth out, going back to this point that trade was also resilient, great. So what we are saying, the adverse effect that is price in the risk premium, that didn't happen this time around. And that's why we have all these risk premium measures, right? They didn't go up as much as the historical episodes. Now, the, you know, we can definitely look at impact uh, on exports, imports, all those things. But again, you know, if the story is a you know, collapse of domestic demand, that's still the financial channel in our, uh, in our world because it's about capital outflows, right? So as long as capital outflows is there, and if that capital outflows is not going with an export increasing, so your GDP is increasing in your country, that means trade channel is not working, right? That's, that's what it means. So we are not ignoring that. It is there. It's just that the adverse things uh, meant to come theoretically and also in the data from the financial channel. In terms of commodity prices, the same thing. Goes back to the question and other things happening. We, of course, run all these things with time fixed effects, right? So, in fact, I think maybe Christine and Jean-Marie didn't read that part of the paper carefully, but there is no such thing as small sampler. Let me <laughs> clarify this very well. This is not that we are working six countries and all that. Okay. So, first, everything that I showed you done both ways. You divide the sample and also you interact. We do the interaction regressions where we f use these variables fully, not just dividing the sample, okay? So there, uh, in that sense, you can have the interaction variable in a continuous sense, uh, feeding in the improvement in credibility or effects that, or you can do it as the applied micro people do in a, in a, in a dummy sense. So they are both going to get the uh, same results. And when we do those interaction regression, of course, that will give us the power to put a time fix effect. Then you don't estimate the direct of the effect of the US monetary policy, but then that means you also control all sorts of other things commodity prices, oil prices, VIX, and all the things that is going to work at the global level. So in that sense, that is not uh, something we are worried about. Um, okay, so Steve's point is a very important one. Again, goes to this fact that U.S. high yield, uh, corporate high yield spreads behave very similarly to emerging market, right? I, I fully agree with that. In that sense, they didn't also move a lot, goes back to this explanation that you know, maybe with all this tightening, very fast and rapid, maybe 
we didn't really have in our hands a risk off shock, right? It can, it can very well be. I mean, macro data cannot you know, separate that. That's exactly why you know, in this literature, we, all of us move to working with micro data, granular data, credit register, data, so that we can separate these stories. Um, okay, so let me also clarify a couple more things. Uh, the data issue. Now, the, uh, the chart Kristen showed and what we use as effects that, I mean, let, this is very important because, you know, Kristen, when you say you can see all these things going down, that would be external debt. Of course, we can do the easy thing and just use external debt instead of FX debt. External debt of all emerging markets coming down, and that's exactly what is going to drive in what Jean Maria mentioned. Why don't you look at you know currency exposure, net foreign liabilities, you know all those things? Yes, you know th those things we can go back to 1990s and plot it. It will be coming. Back. That's not the vulnerability. So we are trying to do the right thing here, which is the hard thing, obviously. The vulnerability is the unhedged dollar debt in your private sector. This is how the story works historically. Let me let me be very clear about it. Fed hikes, okay. Capital flows out. This is why financial channel is important. When capital flows out, your currency depreciates. Your corporate sector is 50% borrowed dollars. What are you going to do as a central bank? Okay? Your economy is contracting. You want to reduce your rate, your monetary policy rate. But you cannot because there is this depreciation and capital outflow problem. So even you are not a pegging country, we don't use pegs, you have to mimic the Fed right? because of that vulnerability of dollar debt in your corporate sector. This is what we are trying to get at. This entire monetary policy credibility is exactly that. Yes, of course, all those other things happen too. They have more reserves. They have, better, they have lower current account deficit. They have better macro prudential. Yes, because they have monetary policy credibility. What is monetary policy credibility? Monetary policy credibility is very simply, do what you say you do. If you write on a paper, this is my charter as a central bank. I'm going to target price stability. I'm going to be transparent about it. This is how I'm going to use it, using interest rate two. And then you go and use that interest rate tool to manage your currency and capital flows. That is not a credible monetary policy. This is what they have been doing. And they stopped doing that. Why they stopped doing that? Of course, as Kristen said, they start using macro potential policies to exactly manage that effects debt. They start, you know, borrow less externally, lowering current account deficit. Yes. But all that happened, all those other outcomes happen because they finally understand how to do the monetary policy right and how the importance of monetary policy credibility. And of course, also being less vulnerable in terms of the corporate sector, uh, uh, in terms of payments of dollar. So this is, this is what we are trying to get at. Okay, so um, let me see. Oh, all those, I fully agree with Jean Maria that the response are heterogeneous and uh, the, um, the late, uh, you know, the low income countries, there is table one in the paper, you can see it is all color coded. So emerging markets are in red and all these poorer in trouble countries, all those trouble are about actually government debt. So that's your classical developing country problem. They, we all drop them. We can do the entire thing only for emerging markets. In fact, it is done in the paper. Why we started with emerging market and developing economies, this big uh, sample, we were trying to uh, uh, you know, follow this very nice Brookings paper from last year by Opsfeld and Zoo. They have 26 emerging markets. I mean, it is hard to get emerging market data. Let me be very clear. So we kind of follow their footsteps and we start with this broad sample, but I fully agree with Jean Maria. It is about emerging markets and all our stuff can be done only for emerging markets and not uh, for the other countries. So that's not a problem. Okay. I, I really want to give a word on police so maybe she can explain the whole confidentiality issue and uh, yeah. Yeah, thanks Shevnam for the, for the great uh, presentation and also for the discussions. Um, I, it makes, part, makes me particularly happy to see John Maria commenting on my paper. He was my first boss at the fund. And also many of you in the room, uh, to the extent I have seen, I think I had an opportunity to discuss uh, as we were developing this index at the, at the IMF. So just a, a couple of things think on the confidentiality. Yes, I mean, that's a, that's a big issue and we are actively working to make this data uh, publicly available. Just to make sure there is nothing confidential in the data in the sense that uh, we are uh, uh, collecting, we have collected this information from central banks' laws and websites and looking to the, to the monetary policy reports and all the communications, etc. The only thing is that we need to uh, make them uh, agree with the, with the assessment. So that's the, that's the complicated part, but I agree it's very important. Also because, for example, Kristin showed the, the number for Turkey. It looks like an improvement from 2007. Uh, of course, it also, as she mentioned, this also reflects the base effect, but also that we don't see uh, in that graph, we don't see 
what happened between 2007 and 2021 in the sense of a, a change, for example, a deterioration from uh, 2013 to 2021. So uh, it's important to make this data public. Um, on, on, uh, I want to add a couple of more things on, um, just to add on. So yes, everything is related. These are emerging market economies and, and everything is related. Uh, but we do believe that the monetary policy framework, first of all, is a, is a really good, um, I believe, a proxy for institutional quality more broadly. It implies that your parliament is, has given uh, enough uh, goals to the central bank. It leaves uh, it to be independent in operational sense. The central bank is independently communicating its uh, policy tools and objectives and also uh, is able to be con consistent with uh, what they say that they, they do. So it's not just a, a, a measure that uh, whether you're an IT or not and it's just a single number, it has a lot of different elements and and we can, I can talk uh, hours about that, but, you know, so for example, if you were to put Turkey, Turkey is an IT since uh, early 2000s, and it's a floating exchange rate regime, so you wouldn't see any change in Turkey or any other, many other emerging market countries. So there's almost no way to, for us to see uh, these type of improvements. And of course, as I said, I mean, these are, uh, everything is correlated in these countries, but at the same time, they do improve in many different di dimensions. So we cannot, I mean, there is no, uh, the, the fact that they are emerging market economies doesn't mean that they cannot move in certain dimension for, for better, better things and bigger things, right? So we, our perspective shouldn't be stagnant and we should allow some dimensions where they can make improvements. Currently I'm in, on mission in Santiago, Chile, and being from Turkey, I can tell you that there's a lot of difference between these um, emerging markets also. So thanks a lot again for the discussion, and uh, I, I look forward to interacting uh, with many of you further on this, uh, hopefully in the future. Thank you. Okay, I just, well, I, I'm, I'm sorry you all want to leave, but I just want to add one thing. When resilience started is also very important, what Jean-Marie said. In fact, Jean-Marie, you're exactly right. If we stop the sample like, you know, 2007, I mean, after the global financial crisis, like 10, 11, then capital outflow thing is much stronger, right? come more recent than you almost see no capital outflow. So this goes back to you are resilient to sudden stop more and more. This is, this is exactly the process and we can, we can definitely show that. Yeah. Okay, so uh, the next thing on the agenda is uh, a cocktail hour at 6 and then a dinner at 6.30. So those of you that have registered for that, um, it's over at the uh, DuPont Circle Hotel and you just show up and the people from the staff of Brookings is going to be able to direct us to the right place. We have to sign in and stuff. There's going to be some security. Um, that's one thing. The other thing I wanted to say is just uh, your name tags and your, your um, pyramids, whatever these things are called. You're supposed to uh, hand them in to the staff right outside before you leave so that we can use them tomorrow. So see you uh, at 6. I'm sorry to miss you.